get started. Can I remind members that this meeting of the Council will be recorded? So, first of all, uh, Julie, can we have the call for the sedent and any apologies? Thank you, Provost, and good morning, members. Provost Barry Douglas. Here. Councillor Ellen Freel. I'm here, Julie. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gordon Jenkins has indicated he'll be joining us later this morning. Councillor John McFadgen. Apologies. Thank you. Councillor John McGee. Yeah. Councillor Helen Coffey. Here. Councillor Ian Grant. Present. Councillor Maureen Mackay. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Tom Cook. Here. I have an apology from Councillor Lillian Jones. Councillor Ian Linton. Here. Councillor Douglas Reid. Here. Councillor Fiona Campbell. Here, thanks. Councillor John Campbell. Here. Councillor John Herd. Here. Councillor John Knapp. Here. Councillor Claire Maitland. Here. Councillor Jim Todd. Here, Joy. Deputy Provost Sally Cogley. Here. Councillor George Mayer. Here. I have an apology from Councillor Elena Whittam. Councillor Claire Leach. Here, Joy. Councillor Neil McGee. Here. Councillor Jim Roberts. Here, Joy. Councillor Alison Simmons. Here. Councillor Billy Crawford. Um. Councillor Jim McMahon. Here, Julie, thanks. Councillor Jackie Todd. Here, thanks, Julie. Councillor Walter Young. It, he's having problems getting connected this morning with IT. He's trying to get Ian Hill, so he hopes to join us as quick as he can. Thanks, Councillor. Rebooting since half past eight. OK, thank you. Councillor John Bell. Councillor Bell. Councillor Elaine Dinwoody. Present, Julie. Thank you. And Councillor Drew Filson. Here. Thanks very much. Thank you, Julie. Um, OK, we're going to item one on the business, which is declarations of interest. Any yeah. members, any interest to declare? Yeah. Councillor McGee. Yeah. Fair enough. McGee. Yep. Yeah. OK. Any other members? Declarations of interest? Provost, through you, just to confirm that we don't require to record membership of the IJB. That's covered with a special dispensation, but councils are obviously right to raise it, but we don't need to formally record it for the minute. But it's right that we are cited on it. Thank you, David. Councillor Reid. No, the dispensations for the uh, I no, it's a council appointment. No, you're you're okay for the health board as well. Okay, thank you very much. There have been no other declarations of interest. We'll go into business proper. That's item number two in your papers, which pages three to forty-five, and that's the national care review. And I'll let Eddie come in first of all. Uh, thanks, Provost. Good morning, members. Um, I'm pleased to be able to, to meet full council today for a further discussion uh, around our submission in terms of the consultation on the National Care Service for uh, Scotland. Uh, clearly, you know, with us today is, you know, Craig MacArthur, uh, the Chief Officer of the uh, IJB and Director of Health and Social Care, and a range of other uh, colleagues here to give us advice and discussion as we go through. The reason I'm, I say that is because I think it's important to highlight that here in East Ayrshire we have made integration of health and social care uh, work for us and we've done that through a collaborative approach between the Council, the IJB and the, the Health Board. And as we go through the consultation, I think it's important to, to highlight that. It's our intention, uh, if at all possible, and we think very likely that we will do a unified response, you know, between the Council and the, the IJB. And if there are any areas where there are differences, we'll simply highlight where the differences are uh, within that, that response. So just that is, is background. When we came to uh, Council um, at the 25th of, of August, 
our intention was at this time we would be coming to get sign off from council for our uh, response. Um, the timetable for that has changed a bit, and I think that's a positive thing uh, for us. And so now we don't need to submit till the 2nd of uh, November. Therefore, what we've brought to you today is a con bringing together all the responses we've had to date, including our joint event that we had with uh, the IGIB and partners. It's important to say our wider partners have been part of that uh, and able to take you know guidance from yourself as council uh, at each section, what you think are the things that we want to highlight in particular in terms of uh, the response. I think it's also important to say that the format of the response that we have given is not the format of answering 95 straight questions that were in the original consultation. The format that we've done does follow a Scottish government, you know, format in terms of the, they provided us very helpfully a summary of the different sections. So what you'll see within that is each section, and we will talk about each section as we go through and be able to put something in there. The reason we've done that is we found many of the questions very directive eh, and not giving us the scope to give the type of response that we maybe would like to give eh, in terms of the, the consultation. But for instance, for that is, you know, an ask about how people may wish to access services. And, you know, they gave a number of options about how people may wish to access services. Really, if we're going down a human rights person-centred approach, we'll find that people will access services in many different ways, not one single way. And therefore, you know, we needed a box somewhere to tick all of the above, you know, every now and again to actually just say that that's, people are not like that and can't be put in, in boxes. So that being said, you know, so our format is slightly different. In terms of the actual consultation, you know, members are all uh, well aware that there was the independent review of adult social care uh, chaired by uh, Derek Feely and we in East Ayrshire uh, through myself, Fiona Lees and John Burns were able to input to that review at that time uh, with a meeting with um, Derek Feely in terms of how we worked here in, in East Ayrshire. You will see in the Feely review there is particular mention not of any individual council but mentions about where you know there is collaborative leadership where there is a comprehensive, you know, delegation to the IGIBs, that that works in terms of how things uh, go go forward, and I think that reflects positively on the work that we have undertaken here in East Ayrshire uh, over uh, the past, you know, eight years. It has been since we started to to do these uh, reviews. I first remember coming to you in a previous role in 2013 uh, to council with some of these uh, papers. It's important to say that this consultation. It's not about a consultation on the Feely Independent Review. It's about the government's response to that, which is a much broader response than Feely itself. And so it's important that we also uh, do uh, that. In terms of uh, where uh, we would wish, wish to go today, with you know your agreement, I would wish to go to uh, the appendix and actually work through section by section uh, in terms of you know where the responses have, because what I actually want to hear is clearly from members your guidance in terms of what we will put into this final uh, response. What you have there is, is all the, 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 the separate responses. Clearly, we'll write that in each part, each section into a narrative. That, you know, and what we will do then is overall is we will put a summary of our response at the front of that to go. Provis, with, with your agreement, I'll pause there because that's me kind of describe the structural arrangements before we get into the, the detail and just take any comment from any members about the proposals of how we actually respond uh, to that. Thank you, Eddie. Members, you've heard the Chief Executive. Have you any comments on the structure in terms of how we're going to go through this today? Any comments from members? None in the room. I don't see any online. Nobody? Somebody's got their hand up. Right. Councillor Mackay, do you want to come in? Thank you very much. Uh, Chief Exec, could I just ask, there are various points in the covering report which make statements along the basis of, and I quote from paragraph 23, 
fundamental and unintended consequences is a comment that's made as an example. Unfortunately, when it comes to the covering report, I don't really see where I'm given examples of what those fundamental and unintended consequences might be from the experience, and this is considerable experience of our officers. So I'm going to be asking throughout our consideration of the case of today for specific examples and would ask when the paper is being presented that we are given specific examples of what those fundamental unintended consequences would actually be and that those are highlighted because I think that's what will be really helpful and will enable us to be really informed in making decisions and making additional comments today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mackay. Eddie? Uh, thanks, Councillor Mackay. I think that's that's uh, a helpful statement, and although we'll pick them up as we we go through, if I give two examples of, of fundamental but unintended consequences, you know, the first one may be VAT, maybe a, a fundamental consequence. Uh, the second one on a service base, there's mention that justice may go into it, but may go into it at a later date. Well, for us, if justice doesn't get into it, we're left with our justice services floating in the middle of nowhere, you know, in terms of having to set up a separate structure, you know, uh, for them. So there are a couple of things like that that is, is helpful that we'll highlight uh, as we as we go through uh, the sections, uh, if, that, if that's okay with members. Thank you. Any other comments from members before we progress? Councillor Reid. I think in general terms, I think this is the right way to go about it. I think you know we could be here all day answering 95 different points of the government, but I think there's a, you know, we've got our own narrative here, and I think that's in common with what Coisler's doing as a whole, and I think that's the right to do that in that format. Thank you, Eddie. Craig, it's fair point. Craig, do you want to come in at any point? No, I think Paul is fair to say in terms of uh, the approach we'll take here, we'll take a similar report and session to the IGIB next week just to give them the opportunity to review on that same sort of thematic basis. Um, if there are any differences or any areas where we, we feel that the IGIB response and the council response might differ, then clearly we can highlight that within the overall response that we then submit to government. But I think that's a bit helpful sort of precursor to that same session that we'll take to the IGIB. Okay, thank you, Craig. Uh, Councillor Linton, do you want in? Thanks, Provost. Um, yeah, it was just really a, a, a got copy of the COSLA the Health and Social Care papers for Monday, and obviously this is the, the main piece of work that they're covering. Their approach is slightly different as well. And I'm reassured by what Eddie has said in regards to answering the 95 questions. I think that doesn't really give you enough scope to get into any great detail with you know, the, the, the limited responses you can put back in the boxes. But I think Eddie's approach and East Ayrshire's approach is, is, is the absolute correct one, that we give more information than the, would be allowed in the 95 uh, questions. So I welcome that. Thank you, Councillor Linton. Councillor Mackay, do you want back in? Again, thank you. Uh, yes, please. Just an overall ask. If you can answer it. That is, overall, the paper makes reference to what the potential impact on the overall reduction of the council budget would be. Seek clarification. If that would also be a truism in the establishment of this as it is being proposed at the moment, that we would see a reduction also in the local health board budget as well, of similar nature. Thank you, Councillor Mackay. I think we picked up most of that. Eddie, you want to come back in? Uh, yeah, thanks, Provost. As you know, Joe and the team have been able to lay out the, the impact on the um, the council. Uh, at an earlier stage, I gave evidence to um, one of the Parliament Health and Sport Committee at, at Parliament, and for that, I had simply then taken, you know, how much of NHS Ayrshire and Arran's uh, budget is actually delegated to the the three IGIBs, and looked at that as a percentage of the overall budget. And at this stage, if all everything that's delegated to the IGIBs moved across into the new arrangement, 
it would be 48% of NHS Ayrshire and Arran's budget that's delegated to the, um, the, the IBs. But as I say, we should remember that we are in a, a position in Ayrshire and Arran where the same as the Council have delegated maximum you know, things at this stage to the IGIB, so of the Health Board, and therefore not everything that's currently delegated to the, the IGIBs may be delegated to the new arrangement. But as I say, I've done the work and we've already used the figures in a, a parliamentary committee, so that's the figure that I used previous, you know, Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Eddie. Any other questions from members? Councillor Grant. Thank you, Chairman. You know, in my experience, you can, when you're running a survey, you can get almost any answer you want, depending on how you load the questions. And I think it would be quite a good idea if we were to, in addition to answering the questions that we've been given in any way that we feel is correct, what would be helpful would be to put in front of them a statement showing the settled will of this council um, as to what our opinion of the overall plan would be. I think that would be helpful to us. It could be relatively short and it could reflect the views of the council following this meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Grant. Can I just ask that members use the function, the hands up function, because I can't see you all, so I don't know if you're waving at me, hands up or otherwise, but and Councillor Linton, do you want to come in? Councillor Linton, you still there? OK, I'm assuming not. We'll move on. Uh, Eddie? Just Sorry, buddy. Uh, OK, no worries. Thank you. Just to, to respond to, to Councillor Grant, it's absolutely the intention that there would be a summary put at the front of the paper, you know, summarising the position of where we are, you know, as well as the, the actual response itself. Clearly, you, they wouldn't have the council paper there, so actually we need to write a summary narrative that sits on the front of it to actually uh, submit uh, that. That I think it's important that all the time that we do this, you know, we recognise three things. That first of all, we have been really committed to integration of health and social care. That secondly, there's some good things in this consultation about recognising workforce, about human rights approaches, about some of the national work that can be done. But thirdly, there are other areas that we have got concerns about loss of some of the local impact and that. So I do think it's important that sometimes when we look at the, the negative impacts, we get totally overtaken by that. There's some good things in this as well, and I think we should make sure we're reflecting that too. Thank you, Eddie. Any other comments from members before we go through the paper? Okay, I propose we make a start then by going through the by chapter. We'll start with the improving care for people, chapter one. Eddie. Um, thanks, Provost. It's, it's not my intention to you know to, to sit and read out you know any of of, of this uh, paper, but clearly starting at this page sixteen in chapter one. You know that some of the the proposals are about a national improvement program for for social uh, care. Uh, members will see from the responses that, in the whole, that there is a positive you know response to that. I suppose one of the areas that we can reflect upon that was like that previously was the early years collaborative that was run at a national level but had a local uh, impact. So so that's one of the areas that I think is likely something that we would see as, as a positive. But again, Provost, so pause for any comments from, from members from that section. Thank you, Eddie. Members, any questions? Councillor McGee. <coughs> Hi, thanks, Eddie. And, uh, I welcome the, the paper coming here to full council and welcome the format that it's laid out on. I think it's quite positive. I, I think, <coughs> I don't think Gomdu do would be against getting set in a national uh, standard of care, or a national care standard. I think everybody would be welcome to that. But I think uh, when, we, when we look at this, uh, the resources that are required, the uh, talks in uh, Philly, when they add up all the recommendation, it's 0.66 billion uh, pounds. And I think when we look at that 0.66 billion, if we're talking about, uh, and we end up falling into this trap of a one-size-fits-all approach, then would that 0.66 billion actually be enough? And a one-size-fits-all approach isn't the right thing. 
Uh, <clears throat> if we're talking about levelling up over uh, workforces, uh, sorry, clapping for them on a Thursday uh, and supporting our carers and saying they've a, done a great job. But one section of the workforce is getting 4%, and our section of the workforce is getting 2%. How do we fund to make sure they all get a, a reasonable uh, pay rise and reasonable training and advancement uh, opportunities based on 0.66 billion? It sounds like a huge sum of money, but once we pay for a new chief executive, once we pay for various other things, there'll not be much left on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Um, Councillor Reid. Thanks. I mean, I think... <laughs> We'll see a bit of repetition as we go in, and I think there's a big battle here, you know, in terms of control versus delivery. I mean, we are delivering, you know, and it's a classic, you know, centralist, uh, local localism here. And straight away, you know, we're into absolutely one size, as John says, Disney fit all. And here, you just straight away with career breaks, uh, career breaks, uh, uh, we're saying that's the case that can be, you know. Uh, Folk have got different circumstances. We're the best place to judge that on the ground. And, you know, I think through the, the whole COVID crisis, I think that has been fundamentally, in terms of delivering joined up services, uh, not just the council, but our communities have been able to uh, deliver things because they know each intricate part of it, our, our communities far better than any kind of national uh, agency can do. So, you know, straight away, and I think that narrative is going to go right through the that, that's report. Thank you, Councillor Reid. I think Councillor Cook's in next. Thanks, Provost. Yeah, I don't disagree with anything that's been said. And just, you know, looking at the section about standard records, we know the problems of trying to integrate various IT systems. Uh, none of them seem to work as they're designed. Uh, and I think, you know, that's a, an, an absolute tremendous task trying to amalgamate all these various IT systems in a, in a sensible period of time. So I think there's a big, big issue around that as well. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thanks very much, Provost. I really disagree with any of the comments so far. Um, I think in regard to what we've actually done in East Ayrshire over the years, in regard to the approach we have taken, I think the demonstration of good practice uh, and what we have achieved should not be underestimated. And hopefully within the process, uh, you know, we can embark on extolling the virtues of what we have done here. Because let's be honest, we've been held up as an exemplar in many occasions in regard to what we have done in the past. Um, I think chapter one, the response is a good one. Um, you, know, you can link in with the GIFT uh, model, the same as what has been done in education. You know, that's, that's a good one. But Tom's right in regard to, you know, the likes of the systems. Um, you look at page uh, page 20, the third paragraph down, it highlights the out of, out of hours period that is currently challenging to access information from health, health systems. That's a particularly worrying one because if we're going to embark down in, you know, this route, then we have systems, we need to have systems that's going to talk to one another, otherwise you're going to have problems straight away. Whether it's a bespoke system or uh, whatever system we use, it is important that all partners should be able to access that information. Thanks, Provost. Thank you. Good comments as ever from Councillor Roberts. Any other comments from members on this part of the paper? Somebody else has got their hand up. Oh. Councillor Heard and then Councillor Cook. Thanks, Provost. Once again, agreeing with the comments so far. It seems that we could and should learn lessons from the formation of Police Scotland back in 2013, not least around the integration of IT systems, which still doesn't work in many cases. And of course, the VAT question, which was spoken about earlier, and no doubt that will come up again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Chair, my, uh, Provost, my hand's not up as far as I can see. OK, any other questions? Ian Grant, Councillor Grant. Thanks, Chairman. Um, yeah, the other thing that I was thinking about was that, you know, we've mentioned in, in our early discussions about human rights, and I feel that centralising a lot of information about vulnerable people 
um, where that information might be leaked, stolen or, or abused is, is not a system that I'm particularly in favour of. I think, you know, when you have local uh, control and um, everything is kept in its own separate division, you know, we're not going to find a file left in a train or a bus somewhere that contains information about thousands of vulnerable people in Scotland. I would rather see it separated the way it is at the moment, where the people's information can be protected. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Grant. Councillor Mackay? Again, built on what Councillor Herrick has said in terms of the failure to make the IT actually work in relation to East Scotland. We know exactly the well highlighted specific incident where there was tragedy because that didn't work. In terms of this particular service, we are dealing with something which is not just has the potential for fatality, but it's actually about people's very life, about often whether people live or die. And I think the points that have been made need to actually be further highlighted as to the vulnerability, because we cannot, no matter how much we want to guarantee the speed of integration and the speed of transfer to any new integrated data source, and what that has the potential to actually mean for people's lives. I think that needs to be specified within the data. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kai. Councillor Jim Todd. Thanks, Provost. Uh, just to let uh, Councillor Mackay know, I couldn't hear uh, a lot of what she said there. Uh, there were some points I think I missed. And um, uh, just to be helpful, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Todd. Uh, the, the feedback isn't great, uh, Councillor Mackay. Uh, did we catch most of what Councillor Mackay had to say, Eddie? Uh, through you, Provost, yeah, absolutely. You know, Councillor Mackay, highlighting you know the, the risks uh, in terms of uh, any type of d data failure or integration of systems failure on oh, this particular uh, vulnerable group of, of people you know just by the very nature of the people that were uh, were working with in this that there could be added vulnerabilities and make sure in the response to the council uh, that we we highlight um that thank you eddie no i think that was the thrust of what councillor Mackay had to say and i think that would be uh, wise to include uh, certainly strengthen that response in that regard. Any other comments from members in this section? Councillor Mayor? Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Uh, if we can look at the bottom, the bottom paragraph in page 22, where it says that, you know, recognising a large number of care homes are private businesses uh, with the expectations of achieving profit. I mean, I think that was finally shown up if you like in the in the covid uh, carry on uh, and it does say there that the profit should be used for reinvestment but how how do we uh, how do we impress that upon the operators of the care homes i think we need to be a bit stronger there in uh, in tackling this situation you know that the private homes that are there to make a profit if we can be a bit stronger in, in condemning that practice, if that's at all possible. Thank you. Thank you, you Councillor Mayor. Eddie? Uh, thanks. Um, can I, can I, I'll answer this direct. Can I say some of the things that are coming up are parts of different sections later on in the, the, the consultation? It'll actually help as we, as we get there. But me trying to work through page by page, this is, we're going to be here at five o'clock tonight uh, in terms of uh, this. But in terms of what um, Councillor Mayor said, uh, that does link directly back to the independent review of adult social care, the Feely Review, where they spoke about ethical commissioning. Mm -hmm. And that didn't criticise, you know, local providers who provided a local service and, you know, made a, a profit as, as, as a business here locally providing good care. The more concern was around any very large groups where actually 
you know, like big parts of public funding actually leaked out the system uh, to, you know, like wider, you know, like enterprises and sometimes right out with the country. That was where there was a, a, a focus on that. So it wasn't about the small local business, it was about wider. And that falls within the commissioning part of this, you know, later on in terms of ethical commissioning and what that actually uh, means uh, in terms of making sure that that public sector investment in care remains focused on public sector investment in care. And if there are additional resources, just as it said, and I think Councillor Mayor saying, that that's focused on um, the quality of, of life of some of the folk within these services, uh, rather than, than leaking out the system. Thank you, Eddie. Councillor Maitland. Thank you, Provost. It's just following on for what Eddie said there, and it's um, it's about something so basic as um, they have to pay the living wage. Now, I believe that came out of the um, the previous report as well. So, if the, there should be no profits before their staff are paid a decent wage. Thank you, Councillor Maitland. Point well made. Okay. Yep, we've still got, I don't know if it's a legacy hand of Councillor Jim Todd, Councillor Ian Grant, either of you? No. Councillor Todd? No. Okay. Councillor McGee? Hi, <coughs> Eddie. Uh, despite the format we set up, I think we could be here for quite a while anyway. And, I, and, and it's going to take as long as it takes because I think that's as we all can, is a really serious issue and causing us uh, some concern. But when we just go to the profit, I mean, I think in Philly, I think it was the Philly report was stating that for every one pound invested in care can create another two pound uh, elsewhere in the economy. And, and if you were investing that money in care, it would create two or three times as many jobs if, as if you'd invested it in uh, construction, so to speak. So I would say that <clears throat> ethical commissioning it would probably help in community wealth building as well. But I think what our fear is that you get a big company sees, well, there's somebody putting 0.66 billion into healthcare. I'm for a chunk of that. And then what they're doing is diverting the funds into profit and no into the people. And as we've said hour and hour, it's a phrase it's ingrained in in my mind for the time I've been in East Ayrshire. People are person-centred care because all this is good to, at the end of the day, help the folk that we're actually serving, the people that are in our care at whatever level. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Any other comments on this section from members? Okay, I think we can move on, Eddie. Thanks. So, I mean, when we were speaking about the sections, you know, first of all, we spoke about improvement. Members have spoke, as you know, in, in, in page 17, we, we speak about uh, access uh, to care. Within that, we do reflect about the wide range of, of access uh, to care uh, within East Ayrshire because the questions were quite uh, prescriptive uh, around that. There's a discussion then, you know, about the removal of eligibility criteria to move to a human rights approach uh, to, to, to care. And I think everyone uh, would, would welcome uh, that. But people should remember that the eligibility criteria uh, wasn't actually imposed, you know, by local government. It was it's a national eligibility, you know, like criteria that depended on resources available that we then w worked alongside. I know, you know, you know my personal background. I think every social worker would, would love to be able to go out there if the resources are available and actually work in a human rights model in terms of how we support local communities. I think it is important also to say that understanding what social care is is important. They're big parts of our, you know, like we call them vibrant communities, our health improvement services, our, you know, housing services even, our social care. And, you know, so there are bits about actually having a wide understanding of social care is also important because that becomes the preventative stuff that actually gets people to have the independent lives that they want rather than being the recipient of personal care or re requiring, you know, care, care homes, whenever that is uh, necessary. So in page 17, and over on to page 18, you know, it's about, you know, the, the models uh, of care and the, 
GI RFE rather than GERFET, getting it right for everyone. You know, I think we would say, as, as we say in a number of places within the response, that legislation already exists. It exists within self-directed support. This is about how people apply, you know, legislation, and that will come back a few times in this, you know, in terms of, of how we do things. And it's there, and I understand, you know, and we heard powerfully from recipients of care at the, you know, the launch of the Feely report about people didn't feel it that way. But that's about, you know, how that's done. And I suppose one of the real questions that's not answered within this is how will you know, taking things to a national care service, approve things for that individual, you know, that's here in, you know, East Ayrshire would be one of the questions that would be uh, around uh, in respect of, of that. So that takes us to page uh, 18, and that's about access to, to care. And again, Provost, I think I should stop there and, you know, for any comments in particular around access to care. Thank you, Eddie. Members, any comments going forward? Yeah, Councillor Grant, Councillor Jim Todd, are you looking to come in? If not, can you put your hands down? Okay. Any other comments, Councillor McGee? I just, just on that, uh, I think, uh, I think we need to emphasise again that going forward, uh, we need to be investing in prevention and early intervention. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing somebody here in resilience, well-being and inclusion. Uh, this needs <clears throat> well, partnership working that we've already got and built up relations over a number of years and now comes focus commissioning. And that phrase, uh, the local lived experience, and I think uh, that is going to be important to us. The work that we are doing, I think we've been, well, I would say, very successful and and I, and I think uh, this is what's causing this concern, the, the, the breakup of you know, these relationships and that possibly going to that kind of one-size-fits-all. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Councillor Mackay, and then Councillor Linton. Councillor Mackay, are you there? I'll move on. We'll go on to Councillor Linton, then Councillor Maitland, yep. and then Councillor Jim Todd. Thanks, Provost. I would just really to agree with the comments that John's made. I think uh, our record on delayed discharge and, and getting the care packages correct for individuals uh, back in their houses has proved to be the correct one rather than tying huge sums of money up in really expensive uh, care homes. I think I think I think we've got this right, and I, and I absolutely support East Ayrshire. Uh, in this. Thank you, Ian. Councillor Maitland? I'm sorry, Chair, my hand isn't up. Councillor Jim Todd. Hey, thanks, Provost. That's me just put my hand up. My hand was, I didn't have uh, the PI icon up uh, for a while. Um, <clears throat> a couple of things uh, I think that we need to get into the report, and I'm sure Eddie and the team will have it in is uh, the excellent work that was done in the past to bring a lot more care uh, provision in-house. Uh, I think East Ayrshire did it better than anybody else. And also the training package, I touched on that uh, a couple of months ago, the training package that's available to our carers is second to none. And I would like to see a, a, a real emphasis in our reply about the things that we did well. One that we, can't, we haven't got any uh, control over is uh, this steamroller is going to come down, and I touched on it uh, at the last council, uh, for our veterans, especially after the absolute debacle that uh, Afghanistan was. Uh, I think there needs to be a whole section on how we look after our veterans, because this is going to slam us right in the face, and there's going to be a lot of uh, broken souls coming back into our communities, and we will have to care for them. And... Um, I think there should be a, 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 a section of our reply um, uh, asking MOD for more money to look after our veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Todd. A point very well made. Eddie? 
Thanks, Provost. Uh, actually, Craig uh, and, and I were speaking this morning, and, and you'll see later on uh, in the, 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 the report, uh, there's responses in relation to uh, mental health and alcohol and drugs. And actually, we both agreed that they were areas that actually definitely need strengthening, given the local context, you know, that we're working in mm -hmm. uh, in, in East Ayrshire. So within that context, you know, Councillor Todd, I think that's certainly so some of the areas that we can say specifically, you know, here is some of the uh, the areas that, that we have worked on, on locally, but we know that the demand uh, coming through there uh, will naturally, you know, like increase as it comes towards us. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from members? Councillor Reid? I, I think we could maybe do a, maybe amplify some with the third sector. You know, I spent uh, a considerable bit of time yesterday with the Open Door a group in Old Irvine Road, and they're absolutely inundated just now with ex servicemen, but just people that are just, uh, particularly post COVID, that are, are coming out and being open just with the various challenges they've got. And they've They've never experienced anything like it, uh, the volume of traffic. So I think, you know, there's other players in the third sector, and I think we need to, you know, maybe, uh, it's maybe later on, I don't know, for, but I think it's something we need to, because certainly a national agency is not going to interact as much as we can uh, with the third sector and uh, dealing with some of these, uh, these uh, clients, for a better word, uh, people. <coughs> Thank you. Eddie, have you any comments at this stage? Uh, no, just referring back to, you know, the previous the discussion about access, that, that's kind of what we're trying to say there. Some people might feel good going to their GP practice. Some might want walk through the door at the Johnny Walker Bond in terms of social work service. Others will feel more comfortable going through, you know, open doors down there because that's where they feel comfortable. Uh, there is no one size fits all for this. Different people have different needs and therefore we'll, we'll go through different routes. <coughs> uh, and I think that's, again, some of the questions previously about how folk access we felt were, were too directive and didn't actually reflect the wide needs of people. And that's what we're trying to say. So, so absolutely, uh, the couple of comments would happy to, <sighs> to include. Thank you, Eddie. OK, we've got Councillor Mackay, then I've got Councillor Grant and then Councillor Neil McGee. Thank you. In terms of the proposal to not do it, or explain why there's a need for another model. The theatre has demonstrated that SDS needs what people across age ranges and care requirements. Is it possible to expand that? Say that there are concerns that establishing another system has the potential to take money out of the direct access that we have the SDS funding. Thank you, Councillor McKay. Let Eddie in at this stage. Um, absolutely. You know, as, as we know, um, everyone who gets a, a social care package should actually, you know, have self directed support. Mm -hmm. uh, people often think of that as only the people who get the direct payment, but people make a choice whether they want a, a direct payment, you know, directly to themselves, they want to tell us you know, how to actually, you know, deliver the care and purchase it for them. That's the second option. The third option is that just ask us to deliver it. And the fourth is a mixture of them all. So, so yes, what Councillor Mackay is saying, it uh, falls within uh, that overall discussion about, you know, like, is there a total resource available uh, at the end of the day to, to deliver this? These are good things in terms of, you know, giving more choice and human rights approaches, getting rid of eligibility criteria. It is what we would aspire to but it has to be resourced to be able to deliver it, or there would be, or back to, you know, as we said before, some of the unintended consequences that you actually start doing, you know, eligibility criteria by another name. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, Councillor Neil McGee, and then Councillor Ian Grant. Thanks, Provost. Just if I could refer back to Dewey's comments about the third sector, uh, as someone who's been involved in it all these days in council, um, it's an important factor in it, and only now are we getting that connection that Eddie and others have created through the Wellbeing Community Plan and all the other facilities. I'm, I'm actually attending a, a meeting with STV this afternoon in Open Lake, and, and with Radar Connected, and all the, the support that people in Open Lake need, but just the whole area. And I just, it terrifies me that this stuff will just slide off the wall. And, and many other aspects of where we're having local connections and improvements 
and it's been a wonderful success and it's getting better every day and it, it worries me that 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 will be lost in the, in the way of this although it's got good points but only very few for me thanks thank you councillor mcgee councillor Ian grant thank you chairman you know as is normal practice in our meetings of this sort we were all asked to declare if we had an interest of any sort a personal interest and actually i would argue that every single person who's taking part in this meeting today has an interest and um, notwithstanding the age profile of our members i think it's fair to say that um, each and every one of us has the potential uh, to be involved with the, the the care process at some stage in our lives and i've always been very proud of the fact that east ayrshire thanks to the huge efforts of people like uh, our chief executive and others within our organization east ayrshire is a good place to grow old it's a place where you can grow with with some degree of certainty that there's a system in place that will help you get through some of these difficult times and I would just like to say that uh, there's a potential to change that, and I hope that we don't oh, please. get to the stage where this is not a good place to go old. Do you want the heat on, Joyce? Oh. Councillor Todd, if you don't mind muting your mic, please. I don't know if everyone heard that, but anyway, there we are. <laughs> Thanks. That's OK, we don't mind that. That's life when we're um, meeting remotely. And uh, I note your comments on the age profile, but I'll remind members there's still two of us uh, on this council who have a three at the start of our, well, <laughs> their know, ages, although that changes for that changes for me tomorrow, but never mind. Well, uh, you just have longer to wait, that's all. But, uh, that's it. Same, I hope. <laughs> OK, uh, anybody else looking to come in? Councillor Mayor, I think. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> Excuse me. Just to follow on a wee bit from what Neil McGee was saying, uh, I don't think there's been anything mentioned so far about the rurality of our area. You know, it's all very well uh, going to for a national scheme as long as the, the rural areas aren't forgotten. Uh, it's sometimes hard enough just now. Uh, with the, the local authority with East Ayrshire, the, the, the rural areas sometimes uh, are seen or sometimes suggested that they suffer a wee bit. So I, I think we should emphasise that point as well, that if we go to a national scheme, that that might uh, exaggerate that case. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Any other comments or questions from members? I think there might be legacy hands. Councillor Grant, are you wanting back in? No? OK. Councillor McGee, I think you're down as well. OK, Eddie, do you want to sum up and we'll move on? Yep, so we'll pick up the, the comments and actually, you know, the next section is around uh, support to, to unpaid carers uh, at the top of page, what, page 18, top of page 19. But again, it's, it's it's very similar. You know, there were different options about how you support uh, unpaid uh, carers. And again, you know, from our respondents, they very much come back and said there is no one size fits all uh, in terms of, of that. So some of the proposals was that if you're an identified unpaid carer, is there a standard, you know, about, you know, some almost that you pay out uh, across that and other types of doing that. And we very much in the line with the, the, the overall ethos of Philly are saying it should be personalised. It should be about what's right for each individual. You know, what's right for one carer very much depends on their circumstances that they, they live within eh, and the resources that they have with they, they live within that. And again, there is there is good work eh, being undertaken in terms of the, the Carers Act eh, and our young carers and med, many of you know like the members eh, will be very familiar eh, with our carer services and you know that the support that, that's given there so again uh, our proposal again is going back to say you know almost the questions uh, are almost negate some of the human rights approaches that we had spoke about earlier and say it should be personalized and it should be not one size fits all uh, for support to, to unpaid uh, carers thank you eddie members any other comments or questions or will we move on yeah. clear maitland and tom cook okay councillor maitland and councillor cook Hi, I just want to echo what Eddie was saying there, that what, when our carers are not one size fits all. That is absolutely right. 
One example of that was a survey a couple of years ago when they asked carers um, how social media helped them cope. And 50% said they felt social media damaged them and it stopped them from coping well. And another said, um, another 50% said social media was their lifeline in caring. So it's just another example. We cannot do the one size fits all. Thank you. It's a fair point. Councillor Cook. Yeah, thanks, Provost. Yeah, just to support that, uh, that very point, I mean, I, I along with other members attended the, the new carers centre and just a couple of weeks back. And you, when you realise that there's so many of these carers are, are you know, are in the early, early years of their life, you know, they're 9, 10, 11 year old looking after parents, their needs are totally different from, say, a husband or a wife looking after their partner. So it has to be, you know, tailored to the individual and we can't have a one size fits all at all. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Any other comments or questions from members? OK, Eddie, I think we'll move on. Uh, thanks, Provost. And, and just to touch on the carers before we move on to that next section, even if we think about how support is provided, we don't provide all our support directly out the carer centre, even the new carer centre. For our young folk, we've got the carer's cottage because that's where they feel more comfortable in rather than that more formal setting. And then for some carers or folk with maybe alcohol or drug uh, problems, they might feel more comfortable going to recovery enterprises and when I chat there, you know, rather than come to us. So it just emphasises that there needs to be a whole suite of different access points, you know, for, for carers and supports uh, around that. The next section is, and we've touched on it uh, before, uh, around use of data and to support care. This is really two sections, you know, in, in respect to this. And I know uh, Eric Sutherland's on the call. And to be honest, Eric speaks much clearer about this than some of, the, some of this that, than I do, uh, to be honest. But the two sections are around, first of all, a personal record. So our own health and care record, which might be held by our GP. It might be held by social work and a whole range of people and how you would draw that together. And that's the first part uh, is, but the second one is about data and how we actually take the almost, you know, strip off the personalised part and put data in to actually help with planning on a national basis. Because again, particularly in relation to social care, often it's felt that there's not the strength of data. And when you go into a room, you know, sometimes our acute hospitals are data rich. They've got points of absolutely every type of pressure point. And in terms of community, not just social care or community health care, don't have that same type of data to be able to argue back and actually you know, make points. So, so there are two separate parts, you know, to this here. And you know, if you would allow, you know, Provost, maybe if, if Eric would want to add anything, you know, to that before four members uh, come in. Thank you. No, I'd appreciate that, Eric. If you could no, give that us some of your wisdom. It's a good point that Eddie makes about how we can use that aggregated data to um, develop services to make um, really critical decisions and to be thinking about how we can operate in more preventative ways. And if we're looking at how we've been moving in East Ayrshire over the last number of years around about having outcomes focused conversations, then we can look at what kind of outcomes people get um, from our interventions and we can look at uh, how we can improve them and shape our commissioning so that we are uh, led by those outcomes. And I think that that's, that's a really good direction of travel here and um, it's knitting all that stuff together in a, in a meaningful way that we can then use at a local level and also thinking about national policy level really driven by outcomes for, for us so it has been our mantra all along thank you thank you eric any comments or questions from members no okay edit uh, thanks, Provost. And just saying, we have picked up earlier the, the issues and concerns that was raised over this, you know, in terms of uh, protection of data, mm. uh, etc. So we've already picked, picked, uh, picked them up and we'll include them uh, around this section. The next area that, that, that we have is around complaints and, and putting things uh, right. And again, you know, people with lived experience, certainly through, through, through Feely, had felt that this was a difficult area in terms of understanding how to uh, access that um, from, and this may be from a, a service perspective, you know, there's been recent work with the, the public sector ombudsman about how you can com do complaints around social care and how we can make that, that more uh, accessible. So, at, you know, the, the response here is certainly saying there can be improvements, 
But again, the question of it is, how would improvements be helped by actually taking this to a national level rather than the, the local level? One of the areas around advocacy, again, you know, like we have strong links with independent advocacy, you know, like here in, in East Ayrshire. And again, resourcing that might be a way of making people feel, you know, like more comfortable uh, in terms of, of that. So, so again, the complaint system is there. And the comment is about whether you pick that a single national point of access uh, for, for complaints. But some of that may be a consequence of where responsibility lies for social care. Because just now, as members know, because overall so responsibility for social care actually lies with the council. The council then delegate it to the IJB, but deliver it, but it still lies here. So people legitimately come to you as councillors because you're responsible for social care and therefore you can come and talk to us about ramps or care packages or whatever. If the council is not responsible for social care, who are the people complaining to? What is the model eh, around that? Is some of the, the questions that it raises. But again, happy to take comments from members around eh, eh, the comments and complaints. Thank you. Councillor McGee, John McGee. I think that's a good point uh, made there, Eddie, and, and I think it's local responsibility and local accountability. Uh, taking it to another area, when folk get flooded, they don't always phone the fire brigade first, but they will phone the council. <coughs> and as you said, when folk don't get their ramp installed, or it can different various things that we have to deal with as councillors, they come to us because we have got that responsibility. And sitting in the IJB and we go through our complaints, and I think we are very good uh, at dealing with all these issues. But we didn't get good overnight. Can we develop it over a number of years, working in partnership, obviously, with the Council and the Health Board? And I don't see that taking local... Uh, Changing it to a national structure is going to help in only way, and this is what uh, Mario concern. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Roberts, Councillor Grant, Councillor Cook. Thanks very much, Provis. I think I would share John's opinion in regard to going to a national level. But I think we know what we can do well, um, and I think in terms of the complaints process. Uh, when you look at East Asia performs, we are doing it uh, relatively well. I think the problem, the problem that I have experienced is when it goes out with the council to say, for example, Ayrshire and Marin, um, as well as been an impact in COVID, which I would imagine there has been, it seems to take forever to get a response, um, especially when there, there are different, different departments um, involved. Um, I have real concerns about this, but I think whatever model we embark on, the process has got to be speeded up because at the end of the day, if somebody's making a formal complaint, then you know they are looking for answers. They don't like to be holding on six months down the line. So I think we need to be extremely careful here uh, in regard to the complaints process, especially when it goes out with uh, East Ayrshire Council. Thanks, Boris. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Councillor Grant, then Councillor Cook. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Um, when it comes to complaints, complaints come in various forms and, and various levels of, of seriousness and, and impact. And I think when it comes to the very most serious complaints, nobody should be left marking their own homework. I do believe that um, whether it's uh, we're running a, a national uh, set up for handling complaints or whether we're handling it locally, there needs to be a degree of independence in terms of how those complaints are looked into and investigated. So from my point of view, the key issue is not whether it's national or local. The key issue is if it's a serious enough complaint or a serious set of complaints, which is something which unfortunately some councils have had in recent years, and um, there needs to be a mechanism in place where those complaints can be reviewed by somebody other than the people who are being complained about. Thank you. Councillor Cook. <clears throat> Thanks, Provost. And it's kind of following on from Councillor McGee's point about, you know, complaints coming in and where we how we address them. I think what's going to happen here if we go into the national system, we're going to lose the links that we have locally. 
if you're looking at you know aids and adaptations in people's houses, not only are the health and social care involved, but obviously housing are involved as well if it's in a council property. And if we lose that connection between the, the council and, and the care itself, it's just going to exacerbate the problem of having aids and adaptations in the people's houses simply because we need to you know, speak to different bodies to get things done. So I think we need to be very careful about how we do that. And I think the other thing that's touched on is the the ombudsman, you know, where does that come into the process if we are now moving to a national uh, complaint system? Thank you, Councillor Cook. Any other comments or questions from members? Councillor Filson. Thanks, Provost. When I was actually on the NHS Administration Board in 2007 2012, I floated the idea. That I was quite willing to do because I got a lot of complaints from uh, my constituents about the NHS that I was willing to do a surgery. It's just the same way the council does. And now we've got the police doing surgeries as well. So I would like the NHS to look at that side of things. Maybe the elected member on the board could do a surgery so we can get that directly straight back to the board, all the complaints. Sure. We'd, we'd uh, look forward to that. <laughs> Any other questions or comments from members? OK, Eddie. Thanks, Provost. Uh, the next session is around uh, charges for uh, care homes and the, the balance of between you know what an individual will pay and what the, the, the state uh, will, will pay uh, around that. And, you know, I think this is again about, you know, like, what is the cost of care and how much the, the fair, you know, like cost of care uh, in terms of how that is, is paid. This has been for us a, a flow through uh, in terms of, you know, how this, this works. You know, like every year you will see in the, the finance papers that come the amount of money allocated uh, for, for free personal care. For residential and you know for for nursing care and that then then flows through at that stage you know each care home can then set their overall charge for what we call self-funders so some people pay a lot more than other people pay pay for for that and again at times that reflects a uh, local uh, circumstances so the cost of property uh, the cost of staff in the center of edinburgh is different from the cost of property and the cost of staff here in, in East Ayrshire. Uh, but to so what I think everyone is saying is the complexity of a, a person's health or care need shouldn't be impacted by, by cost. There may be other choices that, that go on there. But the issue that we need to do is, you know, again, make sure there's fair funding for care uh, within care homes as well as within care at home, I think is the, the reflection here. Some of the work over the pandemic in terms of looking at the quality you know of services within you know care homes could even again exacerbate this even more and it actually goes back to you know an earlier discussion about the totality of the resource available some of that will need to go into this in terms of making sure that we improve care you know rather than to increase the capacity you know of, of care so again happy to take any comments from from members thank you any any comments or questions from members Councillor Linton. Thanks, Provost. My, my question to Eddie is really round about the provider of last resort, which quite clearly the council is. I mean, I'm aware of, you know, care packages, you know, in houses uh, Friday afternoon where um, private carers are not, haven't got staff, you know, for whatever reason, staff rotation, staff retention, whatever it is. Uh, they're unable to meet their commitments and it falls to the council to put somebody in to see to the, the individual's needs and also those that have been about the council will remember back to the collapse of I think we call White Cross and just what I mean that was it it was, it was the council that had to pick up the pieces and, and find alternative accommodation and, and packages for, for all those concerns so I feel that you know if we are going to be down the road of relying heavily on private providers there's, there's a huge risk Involved. Thank you, Councillor Linton. I've got Councillor Jim Todd, then Councillor John McGee. 
Uh, thanks, Provost. Uh, this is a, a, a pat in the back for Craig and the team. Um, uh, I've had a couple of instances where um, there's been care homes, private care homes, um, not stepping up to the mark in terms of care for the residents. And Craig and the team went in there straight away on the two occasions and got it sorted. So well done, Craig, and to you and your team. And I just, uh, not putting Craig on the spot, but do you think you need more power uh, to do the things that you do well? Do you think that needs to be put into legislation with a reply we're putting back? Are you happy with the, the current setup, Craig? Thanks. I'll let Craig come back in on that point. Uh, Councillor Todd, that's well made. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you for your kind words, Councillor Todd, but make sure the team um, like it's passed on to them. But I think in terms of legislation, if the care homes are not doing what they're meant to be doing, there is legislation in place already to deal with that um, through our, our colleagues in the care inspectorate who, who do often go in and inspect um, care homes and where appropriate take the necessary enforcement actions. So I think there is already a, a range of measures in place to allow that to take um, to be taken forward as as we have seen. It doesn't happen often, but we do sometimes see it being um, taken forward that way. Thank you. Councillor John McGee. <clears throat> I think in paragraph 2, page 24, if we're pointing out the consultation is too great a focus on structural change, which will overshadow and delay the importance of improving outcomes quality and standards, both of services and workforce conditions and sustainability. In our view, most of what the consultation proposals could be achieved without structural change. And I think we all can why some private providers can sustain the services they provide, because our care staff are undervalued and underpaid. And I think what we're saying there in that paragraph, we could achieve all this without structural change. But what we need is fair, long-term and sustainable funding linked to a long-term plan that actually understands what social care is actually all about. Because social care covers a wide range uh, of issues. And I think uh, the less structural change and the mere investment would be a better place for us. Thanks for that. Councillor Mackay. Thank you very much. Uh, again, questions from the uh, is there a potential for us to deduct some funds we are able to offer our Sorry, Mar uh, sorry, Councillor Mackay, I can't hear you at all, I'm afraid. Could you, you mind repeating that? Uh, there seems to be a reduction in funds that we currently offer. Will, will the proposals lead to a reduction in the service that we currently offer? Is that what we're, is that what you're asking? No, we, we can't. I'm afraid we can't hear you, Councillor Mackay. We're going to get IT to see if they can assist, uh, if possible. Maureen, uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you want to use the chat function that's there and maybe type in your question, uh, if we're struggling to hear you, um, that would be helpful. And then we can get an answer from that. If you're okay just now, I'm going to move on to allow Councillor Grant back in. But uh, if things improve and you can, but if not, if you can use the chat function, then we'll certainly address that question. Thank you. Councillor Grant. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I'm, I'm hoping we can get Councillor Mackay's comments because I know she has a lot of experience in this area and I would welcome to hear her views on it. And it was just to say that when it comes to the care homes, you know, we're talking about um, commercially run care homes, there's actually a lot of different factors involved here. We, we always, uh, and I always, look first to the requirements of the patients and that's important. And I also look very carefully at the 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 income and the the life experience of the 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 employees who, in many many cases, give up huge sacrifices in order to do this kind of work, and and they have to be applauded for that. 
but there's also other factors involved. There's families involved. There's, um, in some cases, relatively small businesses that are, you know, relying on uh, this sector in order to 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 pay their way through life. So I think when we're assessing, um, you know, the the whole care home sector, we need to consider all the different factors involved in it, not not just maybe the, you know the two most obvious groups who who are uh, at, the, at the top of our agenda. Um, I'd also like to say that I've always considered that a mixed economy tends to function very, very well. Uh, and there will be some instances where we as a council want to be in complete control of the whole system and the whole environment and indeed make payments towards it. But there are other situations where the private sector can provide a very good service and you know we don't necessarily as a council need to be in, involved in every part of it so you know i'd like to to make a plea for the, the the mixed economy where we have complete control in some cases and ownership and in other cases we enjoy the and some very often the the innovation and, and benefits that the private sector can bring thanks Thank you, Councillor Grant. I'll bring in the Chief Executive again. Thanks, Provost. Uh, as a number of members uh, will know, it takes my way back to the report I wrote in 2005, the Strategic Direction of Older People Services, uh, where uh, at that time, uh, Council agreed that we would work with our partners in Scottish care and we, you know, purchase all our care services uh, from the independent sector here in, in East Ayrshire. We work very closely with Scottish Care and have a great partnership with them to do that. And we would focus on the delivery of, of care at home as a council. And again, as been mentioned earlier, we have a high proportion of our care at home, you know, delivered that day. That was a very deliberate thing about understanding that different people have different skills. In any local authority area, you'll actually find the percentage of care homes within the area in any public sector very, very low, and it was our view we would rather work with the sector and improve the sector uh, through that route, and it's, I say it has been successful in doing that, and we have been successful in delivering care at home uh, in terms of that. So that's been a long-term strategy uh, doing that, and the, the, you know, the earlier part of that, the preventative part of that, our partnerships and the wider basis around well-being, again, with the third sector and others that people have mentioned, have been absolutely essential to that too. So, councillor Grant's right, it is a mixed economy of care and is all focusing on, you know, the areas that we're absolutely, you know, like most uh, adapt to do. Thank you, Eddie. Councillor Mackay, we'll try again, see if we can get you back in. Councillor Mackay, are you there? Oh. We've got a question coming in from Councillor Mackay. Eddie? So, uh, Councillor Mackay saying in Chapter 2, is there a potential to see a reduction for what we and each Ayrshire Council currently offer against the new service? If the answer is yes, which I suspect it will be, said Councillor Mackay, without me getting myself into bother, uh, can we give specific examples uh, within a response, perhaps highlighting where we have had a significant uh, success. Uh, I think, yes, you know, the, the answer to that is that uh, just now the relationships, and again, Craig and I were discussing this, this earlier, um, about the relationships is just now that, that the Council of the Health Fund, fund the IGIB, who then commissions a, 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 a volume of, of services through that funding. So ultimately, the amount of resource available is decided at, you know, the council and the, the, the health board level. If that is taken away and the amount of funding is not decided there, the new body will commission. But if the new body comes to the council or to the health board to commission and we deem there's not sufficient, there's not that triangulation back to say, how do you, you know, improve the funding again? You know, like so... I mean, again, I remember a number of years ago, we looked as a council about how much money that we put, put into uh, protecting our children. Again, some of the members may, re may remember it was Susan Taylor done the report, and she the report, wrote the report out and said, this is the resource that we have just now. This is the number of children we are supporting just now. And if you actually break it down, we've only got X number of minutes 
to actually look after each child in a week. And therefore, the council was able to look at that and think we can improve that and actually put more resource into that. That's the type of link that we worry could be broke, that actually that triangulation could be broke eh, in terms of that, because you would be back arguing through a national body about funding, you know, rather than actually having the control here to move resources eh, around. Similarly, you know, like where resources eh, are provided to the council, you know, in terms of um, education for some of our most disadvantaged eh, young folk. That money the council chooses to invest actually through Katie's services to actually support, you know, the families and have less impact on the services and social work. And again, that all that triangulation, not just of the services, which is right for people, but how the resource flows is one of the things that we would be concerned about. And Katie does join up a lot of this. So again, with your agreement, Provost, if Katie comes in and speaks to that. Absolutely. We can get the Deputy Chief Exec to come in. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Eddie. And, you know, my first point is I've been itching to come in on housing because I do think, you know, we're getting a big national investment through the SHIP programme. And to me, you know, this allows us to reflect on the current care home model, whether it's privately run, run by the public sector or run in by, you know, a, a voluntary sector organisation. Is it fit for purpose for the 21st century, the care home model? Would you want your granny to go to some of these places or your grandpa or would you want to be there? And some of the work we did along with Eddie's team at the very beginning of the set up of health and social care was to look at how we ran the, the kind of sheltered housing, as it was called, differently and actually keeping people at home longer. And I would like to put a link in here or some kind of hook at least into saying, can we have, even though we're talking about this being national and you know that debate's going on and on within this chamber and, and wider outside here, but actually there's big, um, big, big investment in new house building. And we've been desperate to try new models of care that are beyond um, a different approach than a care home model is set up. And, you know, we did look at a few of those things, but the problem is you can't attract rent the same way because there's a percentage of whether someone's a tenant or whether they're receiving care. And actually that has, has put a wee few barriers in our place. But, you know, we have talked over the time about how we can actually interface a new model of care that you see in North America. You see in Canada very prevalently where people actually have care where they can they, they, they go in and they have a lower rent, but they help to look after each other. And as they become more dependent, then the, the next person moves up. So it's actually a social model of care. And it's pre going into a care home, regardless of who that's run. So what I'm saying is there's, there's money available through SHIP. We are building lovely new houses. We're building houses that are suitable for people with a whole range of, you know, whether they're elderly or not. But actually, could we look at new models of care that would be a hybrid using um, what work that's coming through the ship anyway. So there's something about, is there a link here, as Eddie said, about that interface? I think this isn't just about how we fund care places and care homes. I think it's about actually, is the, is the care home model always appropriate now going forward as more people will require it? And I think it look, needs to be looked at differently. Um, so that's my view that we put some innovation in here and we try and capture that. Some very good points there. Members, if, if anything else you want to add at this stage, if not, I'm going to call for a five minute comfort break, if that's OK. But if Councillor McGee wants to come in at this point, then we'll, we'll do that. Just very quickly, then, <clears throat> I think the points made there by Katie, both Katie and Eddie, <clears throat> where that triangulation could be broken. And what you hear for some folk, oh, sometimes I don't think the council's got a clue. How do they know they joined up working? And we are then joined up working. And, but that's not necessarily saying that every authority is doing that same joined up working. And I think we need to emphasise that and very, very strongly that that is a huge concern, not just for me, but for all, all the members. And I think we're all expressing much the same thing. Thank you. Thank you, John. Councillor Cook. I think Katie's right. You know, this innovative care system that we, we've developed you know, looking at Lily Hill Gardens, where we've got people in there who at one point needed 24 hour care, and now, you know, we're giving one carer that could look after you know, a dozen of them and give them, the, the, you know, better quality of life, that they've got their own premises, their own house, and that they're still being cared for. So these are just some of the examples I think we need to bring out on this to say, you know, it's not, again, it's not a one size fits all. There are various models of, of care that we need to develop. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from members or can we move to five minute recess? Members that agreed? 
OK, I'll pick back up at 25 past. Thanks.
Members, we're going to get going to continue with uh, the paper, if that's okay. Members are all right. Eddie, I'll get back over to yourself. We can kick off from where we left off. Thanks. Thanks, Provis. So we left off just as we were heading to uh, chapter two, page twenty-three, uh, the the National Care Service, uh, and this is the part where you know really the, the structural change is you know proposed and again members will, will see a wide range of comments uh, around um chapter uh, two the parts of chapter two that we've already reflected you know that about a national care service being established responsible for central functions for instance leading improvement national and regional planning we'll speak about workforce planning later management of data there are many of the things that we can welcome in terms of there being a clear focus uh, of where that uh, is. I think where the challenge uh, then uh, comes is when we talk about uh, that National Care Service then being uh, responsible for community health and social care boards at a local level and you know the accountability uh, being broken from between IGIBs to the Council and the Health Board and now that going to uh, Scottish uh, ministers. You will see from the um, the comments there is a real question uh, around you know, uh, um, making a case for that part of this and how that, that would actually you know give you know give improvement from where we are. An understanding of the role of local communities, the role in terms of, of accountability. None of that is really in any depth, you know, within the consultation uh, at this this stage uh, in terms of, of where we, we are. Ag again, the document, and it's a bit about our last discussion there, 
it doesn't really properly consider the continuing relationships, you know, across housing, education, public health, leisure, acute services at a local level. And again, that's a gap uh, in terms of, of where we are. So again, you know, this is one of the main structural uh, arrangements and there's lots of comments for the for members that we will look to draw together. But again, open to hear, you know, members' views. Thank you, Eddie. Comments or questions from members? Councillor Cook. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Provost. Thanks, Eddie. <clears throat> I mean, I think the report, uh, the comments in the report, you know, cover the main points very, very well. Uh, I mean, the more I read this whole thing, the more I think it's been prepared by civil servants who have really no experience of working in the care sector, because when you see some of the proposals, you know, that seems to be evident. But what I do see in it, particularly in the formation of the, you know, the National Care Service, the local community health, is costs. And at present, we run a fairly slim system using through the IHIB. But as soon as you start setting up a national body, a national care service with a chief executive, then the next thing is, you know, he needs staff and then we need to finance people. And before we know it, it's, it's a coango has been set up. And, and we repeat the thing at local level. Uh, again, you know, at council level with the new set up there as well, again, starting to, to take costs. So uh, the additional money that's actually been put into this, I'm not convinced all of that is going to reach and improve the lives of the people who actually need it. It's going to go to the administration of, of a system that is working well just now. And to me, we just seem to be, you know, trying to throw away one system simply because it's not working everywhere and starting from scratch again, I think would be far better just in trying to make sure that we are the IGIB system integrated board not working, that we get these councils to, to improve theirs and the ones who are actually working well stay with what we've got because we have made this a really efficient and, uh, and effective system. And no mention in there at all about what happens to, to the premises. You know, at present, we share premises. How are we going to do that? What's, where's the cost of these premises going to be? And, and you know what is the formation of these? It does mention that elected members will, will have a role, but exactly what role is not mentioned. And you know, will they have voting rights? Will who appoints them? You know, will the council appoint them, or will it be like NHS where they've got to apply to to become? So there's a whole range of issues in here that are just not covered, and, and how we can be asked to support something with all the holes that are in it, and you don't know at all. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Councillor John McGee, then Councillor Ian Grant. <clears throat> I, I think the concern here is uh, the, the FILA report was an uh, independent uh, report on adult social care. Um, we're now going to a much uh, wider review of a national care service. And we've got so many unknowns, unanswered questions. I really doubt where you can have real consultation meaningful consultation when there are so many unknowns and that's a real concern. Thank you. Councillor Grant. Yeah, I, I detect in this a complete philosophical differences between what we have and what they're looking for. It, it seems to me that their plan is to make everything equal when in fact our plan for years has been to make everything better. And this is where the difference comes. And I think we should point this out that, you know, our drive is to make everything in this system better. And we've achieved huge results in that area. Yes, there's more we can do. Yes, there's things we can tighten up on or improve, especially if we had more funds to do it. But our philosophy, making everything better, has paid dividends and continues to do so. And this philosophy of making everything equal is just going to bring us down to the lowest common denominator, and we all know what that looks like. Thanks. Well, for equality, Councillor Grant, but uh, we'll let in uh, Councillor Roberts, then Councillor Reid. Thanks very much, Provost. Um, I think we're probably all in agreement that you know, there is gaps in this. And I think in all probability, the further on the process goes, some of these gaps will be filled in. But I think we're right to highlight where we perceive these gaps are. Um, I would like to ask a question about the uh, procurement of services. Now, procurement, a lot, a lot of which is done through Scotland XL, and they, they go through the argument, all oh, the economies of scale. But 
linking in the community, wealth building, etc., um, and the importance of you know, the creation of jobs and maintaining jobs in the local area, especially if some frameworks can be put in place where we are using local resources. Can I just ask for clarification in terms of the framework and procurement uh, around some of these structural changes we're going to be seeing? Thanks, Paulus. Thank you, Jim. Eddie? Uh, thanks. I think, you know, some of that is, again, some of the concerns uh, that, that we would have in terms of the understanding within this report about the interdependencies between the health and social care partnership and other parts of the council. Katie's already spoke about some of the service parts of the council. There's practically not a day goes by without one of David's solicitors being in court alongside a social worker in terms of a social work issue. You know, you all know Leslie McLean works absolutely integrally with us in terms of commissioning services. This is clearly saying that that will change. You know, that, the, that, that there will be, you know, the, the role and the responsibility for social work function. And it's a wee bit further on, and Marion, I'm, I'm sure, will want to comment on that later on, will transfer to the National Care Service. So, so all the roles, and again, David may want to talk about some of the roles that we get in support of the council, they're almost invisible that people don't see. But I can assure you, when you see the solicitors going out and in that door every day, they're almost totally going down to, to support either health and social care or Katie service in terms of the housing. But it's in support of the services. It's not something that, that, that's not real. It's very clear what it is. It might be helpful if David spoke about some of these support services. David, do you want to come in? Uh, yeah, I think, as, as has been recognised, it is a consultation. It's got 95 questions. But, you know, without breaking into song, some of those questions beg more questions in return than, than, than answers. Uh, we know what we have and we know it works. We know there's always room for improvement uh, when we're talking about across different public bodies, different partners uh, across the health and social care. There's always uh, room for better joint engagement, et cetera, et cetera. But what isn't made as any case that requires you to put all of that under the, an, a proposed national care service and have a much greater aggregation and commissioning from the centre of a much bigger organisation. Uh, it's difficult to say at the moment when we've been told it will have implications, but we don't know what the alternative might be, what we're then comparing what we have with what might be. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's hard to comment because there's no specific proposals other than there will be an impact. We will need to migrate to something else. But the fundamental point is, is implicit in all of this is uh, while it's presented as your IGIB will become, it won't. The IGIBs will cease to be and they'll be replaced by what will be local boards uh, responsible to and commissioning on behalf of a single national central body. So there's so many variables in what that model looks like, all of which could impact on what the alternative arrangement looks like. But the fundamental point would be that in principle, if you're talking about multiple providers at the moment and going to a single national care service, then whether it's procurement, legal, finance, IT, all your backroom services will need to presumably be considered for disaggregation and we're back into the realms of Chupi and everything else. And that's not to scaremonger. But some of us, as Eddie said, we, we, we do work for the council and we do work for the health board and on a daily basis as a result of the, 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 the two coming together under the partnership. Those distinctions are now pretty blurred as they should be and we, we do what needs to be done on behalf of the single health and social care partnership, but at local level. So what we have here is replicated in any, in, in, you know, I was going to say 32, but any number of health and social care partnerships, but if I remember right, it is also 32. Uh, that, that what we have will be the same there. They will have their own staff, professional and backroom staff. And the bottom line is, is if the work that they undertake under current arrangements is being transferred to a new single national body, then those who carry out that work will be impacted by Chupi. Uh, Light in all likelihood, once we've filled in the blanks and know exactly what the model is, but it's likely that you're going to see uh, the migration of staff to that new body to carry out and continue to carry out and provide professional advice and support in respect of all of those backroom functions, including procurement and legal and finance and IT. And I, I, I appreciate that may not be as clear as, as anyone would wish, but I think as, as members are realising 
the lack of clarity in the proposals makes it hard to be very clear in one's response to those proposals when, in fact, all we can do is speculate in some areas what they actually mean behind the words that are in the consultation. Thank you, David. Councillor Reid and then Councillor John McGee. I think, just as, as others have said, you know, the, the cap for the, for the findings you know, from the Philly report, I think most of us could probably sign up to, but the gap that's been left, you know, as we, as we go towards this model of national care services is huge, and there's absolutely gaping emissions. And I think the example of property, you know, is just completely unanswered, you know, and that's huge in terms of procurement. It's huge in terms of local economy. And you just, I mean, Johnny Walker Bond, Rossi House, you could go on and on. It's a, some of the largest... Uh, employers in, in their town centres and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's doing so much. And I think we've been more than generous in terms of, in the spirit of cooperation, in terms of the amount of property that we've given to the partnership, because we know the outcomes are going to be good for the, our citizens. And, uh, you know, I think I think we'd be less inclined to do so. And I think we'd be looking for more on the value for money side if it was a, to be a national organisation that was to step in. And, and I think, I don't know, the folk in, uh, our community would expect that of us, and uh, I don't think I don't think the, the, the pennies dropped as far as some of the civil servants are, are concerned. Thank you very much, Councillor John McGee. <clears throat> I uh, totally agree with uh, what Councillor Reid has said there. Uh, I think the point uh, uh, David Mitchell made: IGBs will not become; they will be replaced. I think is pretty relevant point. And we talk about uh, Tupi, can be a, a number of staff will be uh, Tupi and over to somebody else at all different levels for solicitors, down to carers. And what results? We talked about that. What about pensions, affecting pension, pension funds, etc.? But that's another unknown. And uh, fully known for Councillor Reid's point, can the gaps and glaring emissions? Can you bone mere glaring emissions than the Chief Social Work Officer is not even mentioned. So I, I think can it is, we need to emphasise this, that we're, we're getting into the unknown here. And how can you consult in something that you don't know? Uh, you can, the, the National Care Service is going to happen because they've gave a commitment to it. But you don't know what it actually is and we're asked to consult on it. Thank you. Eddie? No, thanks. I mean, I think, you know, in terms of the, the comments from members, we'll, we'll be able to take that and, and, and take that uh, uh, forward. I thought Deputy Prof was wanting um, So if we move on then in terms of the scope of the National Care Service, I'll say a wee bit, and then just as Councillor McGee's reflected, I think it will be helpful to hear from our, our Chief Social Work Officer uh, around some of this as well. I think we need to be careful uh, in our response uh, here. Our response may be different from many other councils, uh, and that's because of the commitment that we already have and the delegations that we already have of you know, our children's services, our justice services, and a range of services from the health board to um, the integration joint board. What that shows is a level of maturity and trust across the public bodies you know, within uh, East Ayrshire and indeed Ayrshire and Arran in terms of taking uh, that forward. So whereas many of our other, you know, like, uh, colleagues in terms of councils may be arguing that it's not right for, say, children's services to be part of the National Care Service, our issue is about not about being part of an integrated health and care service. It's about, again, the loss of that democratic local accountability of our, our services here. We already, you know, have made, you know, our services work. We already have our integrated children's services and uh, young uh, children and young people services board, but we make this work already in terms of these things being being delegated. But we do it within a context of local accountability. We do it within a context of you know like the public protection arrangements uh, that we have, and you know the consultation doesn't speak about the role of the chief social work officer. But I do think it's important you know that council hear from Marion in terms of her. Uh, advice and our statutory role in terms of giving advice as Chief Social Work Officer. Thank you, Eddie. No, I would definitely welcome that. Marion, if you want to come in and then we'll open it up to members, if that's OK. Thanks, Provost. Thanks, Eddie. Um, I suppose uh, thanks, Councillor McKee, for highlighting the fact that the role of the Chief Social Work Officer isn't uh, mentioned within the document, which 
we can infer that one way or the other. Um, from that perspective, for me, I think there's maybe an opportunity to highlight the importance of the role of the Chief Social Officer and actually the need for it likely to be enhanced given our experience and and working through the the pandemic and the role that's been, the ask that has been made in respect to the Chief Social Work Officer. Um, Moving to the scope of the National Care Service and the consultation, clearly they're asking um, for a view around um, all in or or, or, or simply adult services. And I suppose um, it's really it's really difficult, isn't it, in terms of that? Because from an East Ayrshire perspective, integration's worked really well for children's services. It's worked really well for for justice services, um, as well as um, colleagues in in the adult world. Um, and and I suppose putting my social work hat on, um, my view would be that for there is real risks to social work, the social work identity, the social and social work practice in terms of. Um, fragmentation um, if we didn't continue with um, a, a, a whole service. And I think bringing that back down to the experience of individuals, there, there would be real challenges to the experience of the person using services. I think throughout the report, there's mention of the whole family approach. And I think that's incredibly important in terms of um, people's experience of social work um, services. People live in families, they don't live in isolation and we need to treat them as such and, and I think if if we fragment it we risk um we risk a a real reduction in the quality of service experience. We risk real challenges around transitional arrangements, so folk transitioning from one service to another, which is a real ambition to get to get that better and, and more seamless. Um, and I think you know for me it comes down to the experience of the individual, and I think the integration has made the ind- experience of the individual in East Ayrshire a better experience than it was previously. So it has worked, and I, and I know that we're in a you, perhaps unique in comparison um, to perhaps other experiences, but, but I think we have to use the positives of our experience in that regard. Um, I'm happy to take any questions in particular, but I think uh, that the document captures much of, of my views in relation to, to this going forward. I'm, I'm probably very concerned about um, what this means for social work. And um, I suppose it's an opportunity to, to give a view around what we think it should look like. Uh, I think there's obviously a given that, this, as Councillor McGee highlighted, that this is going to, to happen. It's the shape and structure of it that we can influence, I think, um, from a local perspective. So happy to take any questions if we've got them. Thank you, Marion. That was a, a very good summation, I think. Councillor Reid in the first instance, and then I'll open it to other members. Thanks. No, I, I think Ed is right just to point out some of these things, and he, he mentioned, uh, he mentioned uh, child service, criminal justice as well, uh, uh, as another big example. You know, and we're, I'm seeing this argument, uh, some of the rest, you might see it, like, through uh, that, that's happening within COSLA. It seems some, and it's no party political, but some councils are arguing for the point of view uh, to con- retain, you know, children's services, criminal justice, and it's this argument control versus the delivery. And for me, delivery wins every time. The best, it's all about delivering good services, to, and it doesn't matter who's delivering them, uh, as long as it's good outcomes for the, our communities out there, and just having that bit of trust. But this, you know, as Marion says there, you know, uh, it, it's, it's going to fragment, fragment it, and it's some of the transitions, some of the, I mean, the, a good example, the good work we've done with the prison, Commander Prison, and, and uh, you know, some of the family support that we've given there, I just, I, 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 it's unimaginable, you know, uh, in the new system, how that could be delivered. And, uh, it's, you know, and building up these trusts in terms of relationships are really important. Uh, where we see, you know, the individual citizen has been important. It's just, it's, it's, it's lost here. Thank you very much. Councillor Grant. Thank you. If you go to Hull, you'll find that the telephone boxes in Hull are yellow and not red, unlike the rest of the United Kingdom. And the reason for that is that Hull, in the face of all sorts of situations and opposition, managed to maintain their own services in an area where they were very, very well respected and very good. Now, I would like to suggest that irrespective of the outcome of this consultation, We, East Ayrshire, the best at what we do in Scotland, as far as I'm aware, Um, no matter what the outcome is, I would like us to ask 
to be independent of the final outcome of this, to maintain our own services. Yes, it would be great if we could influence the Scottish Government to um, utilise our experience and, and help other counties in Scotland, but I don't want to see everything we've worked so hard for to be swept away um, in, in the course of trying to homogenate these services. And I do believe that um, whatever the outcome is, we should, at the very earliest instance, ask that we can retain our independence in this area. Thank you, Councillor Grant. I never thought I'd hear you advocating independence in this council chamber, but there you go. Um, I got in before the council leader did. I'm sure he was desperate to. Um, I, I hear what you, you've got to say. And again, I never thought I'd have uh, the analogy of Hull's post boxes been brought into an East Ayrshire Council debate. You never certainly uh, let us down with bringing in uh, interesting facts, Councillor Grant. I'll let Eddie in and then I think you want in, do you? I think. Uh, I think one of the things about whether we get um, uh, independence uh, in terms of the model or not, I think the commitment that, that you would get from myself, Craig and Hazel Borland, if she was sitting here, is that uh, we'll make this work. You know, like, whatever happens, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day for, you know, the, the, the population here of, of East Ayrshire, we cannot let structural changes get in the way with our ambition uh, for what we want to do. Uh, so so we will do that. It's just one of the things that, whether it makes it easier for you or harder for you at times, uh, that we will make uh, things work. Uh, we have, right at the start, we said that our current arrangements, our trust, was built on sound community planning arrangements. We will keep the sound community planning arrangements uh, and focus uh, on on doing that. What, what what is reflected at the start of there is is that the difference uh, between the integration joint board, mm -hmm. which is a separate public body, uh, which is a, already the commissioning body, and the health and social care partnership, which is the delivery body. And I think it's at times people hard to get the concept uh, of that, and it's the dual role that Craig holds. He's the chief officer of a separate public body, being the integration joint board, that then commissions services just now only through the council and the health board. And for that, he's a director of that, and as a director of the council and the, the health board. What these proposals are doing is separating the two roles. That in effect, the integration joint board uh, is, will no longer be in you know, this new commissioning body, and it leaves the health and social care partnership floating. At its worst, this will see a disintegration of all the work that we've done over recent years of social care services coming back and being managed inside the council, of health care services going back and being managed inside the health board. Because there is no, if it's a commissioning body and not a delivery body, you know, we're left in a, a very difficult place, a really challenging place. And again, this is some of the ambiguity around and when we come to the next section, a couple of sections on, when they talk about responsibility for social work going to the new um, health and social care boards, it's really unclear whether they mean commissioning of social work or delivery of social work, you know, whether all the social workers will be employed within the board or whether simply the board will, will commission. But under that section of the new model, there again, a number of the, the, the levels of ambiguity that, that we're working in, and they're clearly very serious levels of ambiguity eh, that we're working in eh, there. And that was when we spoke before about fundamental risks. That's the type of fundamental risk that, that we have that we could end up in disintegration of services, that the whole purpose of this was actually to promote the further integration of health and care services. Thank you, Eddie. Councillor Reid, then Councillor Roberts. Thanks, Provost. I'm not saying independence is a bad idea. In fact, quite the contrary, or, or necessarily the yellow is a bad colour. Uh, but I, I think we've just got to show leadership as we have done in the past. And, you know, I think that the, the potential disintegration that Eddie, Eddie speaks about is just is, is, going to, is going to cause harm. I'm quite sure the government doesn't, want, you know, doesn't envisage in what they see. And I think we've just really got to point that out to them as strongly as we can. That's a point well made, Councillor Reid. Uh, Councillor Roberts and then Councillor John McGee. Thanks very much, Robert. You know, Marion, I was, I was very interested in your comments. And I think when we look at the page 27 role of the Chief Social Work Officer, I mean, 
should not be underestimating um, what a good job and what an important job the role of the chief social work officer is. Um, I think in regard to the aspect of local knowledge, we can all pontificate about the importance of local knowledge, but in regard to local knowledge in this instance, that is absolutely paramount, the same as it is for other areas. So I think we need to underline the importance of the role of the Chief Social Work Officer and make the point as strong as we possibly can in regard to that importance. Thanks, Boris. Thank you again, is that a well made point? Councillor John McGee, and then we'll bring in Eddie. I, I don't think we, we've got to where we are today in East Ayrshire Council uh, by accident. I think our lifetime East Ayrshire Council, we've continued to uh, develop and improve over the whole lifetime of the, the Council. And uh, I think it's fair to say that we embraced the, the, the method of the IGIB and made it work. And I think what Eddie's saying, we will make it work. And I think every councillor here would have great faith in the officers involved that they would make it work. I worry at what cost, and that's a problem. And I think the, the dismantling of the IGIB is already seen uh, or as another step on the road to dismantling local government, and that is a big issue. Thank you very much. Chief Executive. Uh, thanks, Provost. I, I think around that section, we've clearly got, you know, enough. And, you know, in terms of the council, you know, uh, we, we may want to re reflect when we bring it back, you know, about the wider mm. impacts of public sector reform are also, you know, a, a, a concern for the council. You know, so just now we're also, you know, consulting around the future models of education, you know, for instance. So without getting into too much speculation, I think it would still be right for the council to highlight that this is one element, you know, that there are other elements of public sector reform that could be cumulative here and actually have a wider impact on how we're able to deliver services uh, locally. And I think, you know, we'll make sure we put a paragraph in, you know, in terms of of doing that uh, for that. Deputy Provost, what's the Provost? Yeah, thank you. If I'd just like to reinforce those, those messages that um, the, the disruption that, 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 that will be caused and the, 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 the main question that really hasn't been asked here in terms of do we want to move from local control to central control and it's taken that as an absolute given and that surely should have been the first question that should have been asked here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. Uh, Councillor John McGee. Thanks, Provost. I think I'm just about forgotten the question <laughs> I was going to ask. Uh, but I, I think I'll leave it to another another moment. Fair enough. Members, any other comments or questions or will we move on? We'll make some progress. Okay, Eddie. Uh, thanks, Provost. Uh, the next few pages are, are focused around uh, healthcare and in particular around um, uh, primary care. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly, at the start, we said, you know, our, our intention is that we have a, a, a joint response between the council and the IGIB. You know, um, Craig uh, sits with responsibility for primary care uh, across the whole of Ayrshire and Arran. And a number of the comments here, you know, relate to that rather than directly to um, any services, you know, responsibility of, of the, the council. But the same issues, you know, that come up just now, you know, the, the, the contracting of GP services is a must not delegate. And yet, you know, myself and then Craig has now been responsible for that, acting as a director of, you know, NHS uh, Ayrshire and Arran, and you do that across the whole of, of Ayrshire and Arran. And clearly the proposals are that that's delegated down. And similar to the discussion we had, you know, about David's team and the corporate teams there, there would also need to be a whole range of corporate teams from the NHS, you know, that came across uh, to do that. The issues around managing the contracts, around property and digital infrastructure for, for primary care, again, uh, as, met, as, as mentioned there. And also, you know, the wider issues about how out of our services would, would be managed uh, is there and reflected in the, the response. So a number of the, um, you know, questions are there. 
and clearly as a council we're entitled to have a view in any of them, but they're not actually, you know, like services that we as a council would actually be having the responsibility just now uh, of managing its responsibility of the IGIB delegated down through um, the, the health board uh, was in for the, the services. So, I mean, happy for any comments here, but I think some of the more detailed comments may come through the IGIB for that section. Thank you. Just um, we've had a message from Councillor Maureen Mackay using the chat function. She has asked that if we could very clearly make the point explicit on integration as vocalised by the Chief Executive, explaining that any issues in the past IGIB legislation and choices are options that others choose not to take, unlike us here in East Ayrshire, cannot be masked by the intention for a national care service. She also asked a supplementary question about the potential of those changes in relation to work of local children's panels. So again, if we can maybe strengthen that point, if there's any anything you want to add around that, Eddie. We, we, we can take that on, on board. I mean, again, Marion's more expert in this than, than, than I am, but uh, and we'll come up with social work and social care in the next section, so we'll let her comment uh, uh, there. But the our children's hearing system is already separate, you know, like from, you know, like, uh, our, our provision uh, in terms of, of that. Thank you. Okay. If we move on, uh, Provis. No, that... Councillor McGee is looking in just now. Hi, Provis, and thanks for that. Uh, <clears throat> despite my memory loss, it has, has returned. And uh, just to go back to the previous bit about dismantling the local government, and as Eddie says quite rightly, can he speculate too much? But if health and social care and education were to go, what would we be left with? Community safety? and fixing wee Mrs McGlum's windows. Can, that's the seriousness of this, and that's not to keep councillors employed, it's to make sure that we're providing the right service at the right areas for the people that we're supposed to serve. Thank you. Glad to hear Mrs McGlum get a mention there, John. It wouldn't be a council meeting without it. Um, OK, Eddie, you want to continue? Thanks. Uh, if I move on then to, and I think it's one of the, the very substantive, you know, proposals at the bottom of page uh, 29, and it's the, all the, the duties and responsibilities for social work and adult and children and family social care services should be located within the, the, the National Care Service. Um, it's not clear if what's meant by this is that the commissioning of these services or the delivery uh, of these, these services but what it would mean is, you know, going right back to, um, and it's just the, the Bible of a social worker, uh, the, the Social Work Scotland Act 1968, that, that conferred, you know, all these these duties on councils mm -hmm. for, for, for what we deliver. Um, it would take a substantial change uh, in terms of that. But again, Provost, I think I should defer to the, the Chief Social Worker to talk about that session. Thank you. Marion, if you can come in here, that would be helpful. Thanks, Provost. Thanks, Eddie. Um, just touching on the, the question that Councillor McQuarrie asked around um, children's hearings, um, as Eddie identified, that's a national body in and of itself um, and isn't doesn't form scope of the, the consultation um, and I think will operate as is. Um, and, and obviously social work services in what, whatever form um, they, they take would report in um, accordingly. Um, in relation to, to this section, I think um, one of the one of the key elements that, that once we started to analyse what this means is it's likely that almost every piece of primary legislation that refers to um, social work, uh, children's services, justice services would need to change um, in order to to make this happen. Um, making the point that I'm reiterating the point that I made earlier. Um, social work, the strength of social work is the relationships that that, that it has with with each other. But also other um, organisations. Um, it's that collaborative um, working that makes um, the biggest difference for 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 people's for people's lives. At the heart of everything that we do is the well-being of our communities, um, and clearly all our community planning partners are are, are central uh, central to that. And I think that's built on you know the approaches that we've had in East Ayrshire around that kind of personalization, person-centered approaches that have already been mentioned, including SDS, which we which we do um, incredibly well. Um, I think in terms of, I suppose in, one of the things that strikes me um, considering this is that 
within the children and families um, areas of work, what we're trying to do is actually develop a wellbeing model that is very community and locality focused, because we understand that the uniqueness of some of our communities and the importance of meeting um, those individual needs. At the heart of that is multidisciplinary um, and collaborative working, which I think some of the and I suppose it plays into some of the discussion already that, that there are massive gaps and massive questions within the consultation because there's so much that it doesn't touch on. Um, uh, so th there are real concerns around whether the, the new arrangements would challenge those multidisciplinary um, and collaborative working practices. Um, and again, I think um, it doesn't it doesn't it's not particularly strong on understanding the social care and social work uh, practice and landscape. And I think we could probably enhance enhance that as part of our response to the consultation. I'm um, happy to take any questions or points. Thanks. Thank you, Marion. Any questions or comments from members? Councillor Cook. Thanks, Provost. It's not only really a question for Marion, but it's just expanding on that. I mean, any uh, child focused or child centred uh, needs must reflect education. And there's no mention in this paper of the connection to education. And, you know, we all know how important it is that uh, you know, children with uh, support needs, are, you know, are properly in incorporated and integrated into the education system. And we've actually got a review of that under wages now. So I think that there's a danger there that we lose that link. Uh, Unless, of course, as Councillor McGee alluded to, maybe they, they want to take away the education from the local councils as well and, and leave us empty in dustbins, but that's what further down the line. Thank you very much. Any other comments from members? No, OK, we'll move on, Eddie. Oh, oh. Councillor Jackie Todd. Councillor Jackie Todd, are you looking to come in? Yeah, can yep. you hear me? Yeah, we can do it. Thanks. Yeah, yep. I just wanted to echo again some of the concerns that's been raised. I think it would be potentially perilous and certainly a folly not to place great importance on the multidisciplined and collaborative working that already occurs. Uh, Councillor Cook rightly mentioned education. I think housing as well plays an intrinsic role and working within the local community to establish an individual's person centred needs. And only attempt to separate the two, I don't think, would be good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other points or comments from members? OK, we'll move on. Eddie. Thanks, Provost. The, the next section talks about the role of the uh, nurse uh, director. We've seen an increased role in the nurse director in terms of infection prevention and control and support to, to nursing uh, through the, the pandemic. Um, I think in the whole that's been been welcome. I think there is also a bit of concern that you know, we should always remember that this is people's homes and if we make them too much of a, a clinical you know setting then things like you know like access to individuals it's why you know they're talking about Annie's law and different things is, is required to make sure there's the right balance between the professional nursing practice and you know a homely uh, in, environment. In terms of the response, you know again we are simply saying that the nurse director should have a similar type role for the nursing part uh, of this as the chief social worker has for the, the social you know work uh, part in terms of of that and, and raising it up to uh, that uh, level. In terms of of justice, again you know we would be in a a different place you know and the uh, prisons indeed from from many other. Um, partnerships, uh, given that we have that, that responsibility for uh, the healthcare uh, within uh, the prison. Uh, Marion has recently moved to have integrated management across the social work and uh, the healthcare uh, within the, the, the prison. Uh, the one area that still sits out with that and is the responsibility uh, of the prison is social care. So actually, if someone requires social care, in HMP Kilmarnock, it's a responsibility of the prison and not ourselves. And I think there is a, a, a discussion to, to be had uh, around uh, that. Provost, this is an area that, that Katie leads on, you know, for, for solace uh, and others. And I think it might be helpful to hear a bit of a, a national input from, from Katie around us. Thank you, Katie. 
Yeah, thanks very much for that. Yeah. So in terms of Solace, um, which is the kind of uh, chief execs and senior officers in Scotland across, across the public sector, my, my role is, uh, is the spokesperson for justice and equalities. So I've been asked to kind of feed into this work. And to be honest with you, they've been very interested in what we're doing here, which I've been talking to Eddie about. So we've been saying this all morning. Do you know that the actual feedback in terms of how things work and how things go forward? Some of the feedback I've been giving them is very, very local. But it's very different across Scotland, as we've heard. And this is pro probably where we're getting into a real difficulty here with the debate, because when some of what I've been hearing nationally, it doesn't resonate with me at all in terms of our experience here. So all I can do is make sure that I continue to feed in the, the comments that we've got here. I've been keeping our colleagues in COSLA. I'm working closely with them up to date on what's happening in East Ayrshire. They were very excited that we had a member seminar in this and that, you know, as if that was something, you know, and it included all of you. And, it wanted, you know, and I spoke to them verbally after that because I attended it about the feedback that was there. So I think that, you know, also the other point, and I totally agree with, is this is just another part for me of, of public service reform. We're absolutely at a crossroads in Scotland. And if you look at all the different elements and what we didn't mention here, but I'm sure we will mention throughout is, is around community empowerment. You know, there's legislation around that as well that to me, do you know, where is that in all of this as well? Do you know, or is it is it that as some people kind of maybe are saying, you know, is, is it that, you know, all the different power is going to different places and what's going to be left? you know, in terms of our structure, in terms of local government. So I'm happy to, to continue to be the voice. Um, and I, I don't know if I'm always representative of everyone, but I'm really happy to represent what happens here in East Ayrshire and make sure that we can share the good practice that we've got here. And maybe, you know, sometimes, you know, we say define or be defined. Um, and we've got such great practice here that, you know, that there is some learning that maybe could influence some of this, but it's just how far we can go because it is a national direction. So uh, it's good to have me in this position. Um, and sometimes I think maybe my, I sound I go on too much about the East Ayrshire story, but um, I'm really proud of it. And we've done this differently here. So hope that helps. Thank you, Katie. We've had a question from Councillor Mackay in the chat function. I suspect it relates to the previous item we are just talking about. Um, she says, is it then possible to question if this is in conflict with locality thinking with Scottish Government's strategic approach? I'm assuming that's relative to the, the social work point, but Maureen can perhaps clarify if needs be, Chief Exec. So, so I think that there are a number of the proposals here, although it starts to say that this should be about human rights and it should be person-centred. When you look at some of the detail, and it's it, it, we have tried to reflect it a couple of times, you immediately get right away up to that structural things because it's changing all the structures. So that's what I keep talking about. And at times we lose what the initial intention eh, of, of this was. And interestingly, you know, Derek Feely actually wrote that in his report. He actually, you know, wrote in the report, please keep focused on, you know, the improving outcomes, don't get stuck in the structural stuff. But when you see a paper of this scope, you know, being consulted upon, it's only natural that, that you have to, yeah. or else you, you, you end up going into, you know, like, um, you know, things that are not workable. So, so again, probably just to, you know, like, round off in terms of um, justice <coughs> and prisons, it might be helpful, you know, I don't know whether it would be Craig or Marion that, that would just, you know, say a bit about, you know, like, where we are with them. I think particularly the interdependencies because this is about having a, a national service around prisons in particular. And yet, it been, our prisons have been in a difficult place a number of times over the past 18 months. And it's been local services that have went in and out and supported them eh, in terms of, of that. So, so I do think it would be you know helpful to hear some of that. I think Craig's going. Craig, if you want to come in. Yep. Th thanks, Robert. Thanks, Eddie. So, Mary, maybe I start to this as well, but maybe just reflecting on people have been over certainly over the last number of weeks um, and, and earlier in the year as well in relation to, and it's just a particular example, uh, where they had a COVID outbreak within the prison um, and some of the, the additional demands were placed upon the healthcare team um, are almost unmanageable because of the, the sheer um, number of um, cases you need to deal with. And because of that, you can then call that sort of mutual aid if you want to describe it as that, where you can bring in other community nursing staff from elsewhere across the system. To look at this in a different way, if that was sort of nationalised in some way, do you still have the same access across the, the broader sort of system, mm -hmm. um, I guess, round about it? And, and for us, the real strength of this is the ability to um, to use that to, to work in a sort of a really collaborative 
collaborative way um, to look at the multidisciplinary teams. It's not just nursing staff, we can actually bring in staff from other areas. Um, we've got really strong um, allied health professional input into the prison as well, um, and they work really, really closely across every aspect of it. And it's not just healthcare, those healthcare teams work closely with vibrant communities um, and, and a whole range of other sort of agencies as well, including the third sector, um, to get the best out of all of that. And I guess just going forward, we need to make sure that we, we don't lose any of that real local opportunity um, to make a big difference. I know through the vibrant communities teams, um, we have um, over a, a number of years now worked really closely with um, some of the, the, the young men in prison who have got kids in the communities. Um, so when they are liberated and they go back home again, we can sort of lessen the risk of them reoffending and go back into jail. Um, and that really has a huge impact across the, 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 the whole family environment. And clearly going forward, if we talk about early intervention and prevention, that's where it really starts to make a difference, but we can have that really good interventions at a really early level. Um, and it stops that, hopefully it stops the, the reoffending cycle, either with that young man or potentially with his family further down the line as well. So there are some real opportunities that we see locally um, round about that really close working. And I guess it's not to say that this would take it away, but I think it does certainly jeopardise and put at risk some of that really good work that we've seen taking forward locally. Thank you, Craig. Um, Marion, did you want to come in? Thanks, Paul. I would just want to build on um, what Eddie and Craig have said um, in terms of the, I suppose, the work across not just healthcare but um, justice services more generally. Um, clearly, justice, as already as it's been articulated in the, doc the document, gone through a structural change. And one of the areas that were considered in 2015, or prior to 2015, was about a national service, and it was ruled out at that point. Um, I think justice is strength is from um, local services in terms of that integrated agenda, as Eddie's identified, we've just put in place um, integrated management arrangements and that's about strengthening a person's journey into custody and making it meaningful for them, but more importantly their journey out of custody in order that they are supported in their community to make meaningful and positive change and contribution to their community and we're seeing some really good um, evidence around that um, due to the collaborative working that we're taking forward. Um, I think that the consultation recognises some of the complexities around justice and is suggesting that if it was to be part of the National Care Service, it would be at a later date. I think that would be problematic in terms of where that would leave justice services. Um, also, if there's one service that relies on, on all of the other services that we've mentioned already, for example, um, health, health care in the prison, but health care in the community in terms of mental health support, addiction support, um, that kind of trauma-informed approach that we're trying to develop and take forward. Just the individuals that are involved in justice are, are those that require support from a range of services. So fragmentation, I think, is a real significant um, risk around justice and what that might mean for individuals, what that might mean for communities, um, and what it might mean for um, recidivism or reoffending rates. So I, I, I think, for, for me, I think if we're, whatever happens with justice, it should happen at the same time as, as all other services. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. Um, Councillor McGee, want you in, and then I'll let you in, Eddie. <clears throat> I think uh, the prisons are another example, a uh, good example of joined up working and uh, of joined up thinking and partnership working. Uh, and I think the reduction in reoffending uh, that's happened with this collaborative working, uh, re reducing that reoffending has been something that we, we should be very proud of. We, we've done in that work, and taking us back to as Craig pointed out, uh, the work we've done during COVID. COVID's no over, and even when it is over, there's every chance that we'll have some other kind of pandemic or something to deal with. And I think the way we've dealt with it locally is very important. And I don't think you can deal with something like that just for the centre. And I think the fragmentation of you know, these services, as uh, Marion Macaulay points out, is something that should cause us real serious concern. And I think <clears throat> highlights uh, what I feel about it is that we need to word the response very strongly. And again, the officers, uh, might do their very best to do that, but I think when, as local councillors, we are emphasising that point and giving them that support, that that's what we want them to do, I think sends that message 
a, in a better fashion. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Councillor Cook, and then Councillor Grant, then I'll let Eddie in. Thanks, Provost. A couple of issues there, Marion raised them and rightly. Where, where does justice sit if it's not taken into this new arrangement at, at day one? You know, it's just going to be hanging there. IGIBs will not be there, so you know, where does it go? So I think that's not been addressed at all uh, in, in the paper, and you know we need to, to question what's going to happen on that. The other concern I have is, is around MAPA, you know, public protection. You know, we have a really good arrangement working in, in Ayrshire or East Ayrshire in terms of MAPA, you know, working with, the, with you know, community justice, with the police, with, with social work and housing all involved in that. If, if we break that link, where are we going to go? I mean, we as councillors, I think, can pretty confidently say that, you know, public protection is high on our agenda and we're pretty we're confident in the way that it's operating. When we do get people in our communities that but potentially are, are at risk to the community. You know, we know that they're being properly looked after, properly supervised. But if we break that away from the local link, I'm not sure we could have that same conviction and, and speak so confidently that we're actually aware of what's going on in the community and, and that the people in our communities are being protected. So really concerned about that part of it. I'm interested to hear Marion has any comments. Thank you, Tom. Councillor Grant. Thank you. Uh, I would like to agree with Councillor McGee on, on his points about how forcefully we, we put our point over. Um, many people in East Ayrshire in the last two years have been to hell and back, and the only thing that has saved them is the quality of our people and the quality of the service that we offer and our systems. And we, we, we let those systems be smashed up on the altar of centralisation at our peril. And I do believe that all 32 of us need to fight those points that are going to damage our council and our people with every bit of fibre in our bodies. We need to really make the point that this has aspects to it, which in principle, in some cases can be very good, but in actuality, in terms of how it would be delivered, could be disastrous. And as Councillor McGee said, th there's another problem round the corner waiting, I'm sure, and we need to have the same strength and the same quality of people and the same quality of systems ready to defend the people of East Ayrshire. And I don't think there's anyone in this room doesn't want to make that a priority. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Grant. Um, Eddie? Uh, thanks, Provost. Um, so again, with the comments around justice, we, we will take them forward. I do think it's interesting, you know, Marion mentioned that the proposal was likely that it, yeah, justice, uh, social work service would be transferred later. If you look at the paragraph that, with the bullet point in the middle of uh, page 31, this is from uh, the, con the consultation uh, where it says, including justice, social work in the National Care Service would involve revising existing highly complex funding and delivery arrangements while having to ensure existing effective partnership and services are not disrupted, which would require significant time and resources. I think what we're trying to reflect here, it's not just justice, social work, <laughs> that, that, that actual paragraph that has been written by the consultation, you know, impacts on it's practically everything that they're saying that should go into it would actually have a, a similar uh, thing in terms of once you start moving the responsibility of services around as opposed to some of the other things that we spoke for earlier that might be better to be done at uh, a national uh, level. If we move on, then at the bottom of page 32 and the top of page 33, you know, it speaks about, you know, our alcohol and drug services and our mental health services. As I've said earlier, I think these are, are areas that we, we certainly need to develop uh, a bit more. But again, one of the issues, you know, about them consulting around whether alcohol and drug partnerships should be part of the uh, National Care Service is about what we've already done and the steps we've already taken in here in East Ayrshire. So alcohol and drug partnerships are actually responsible to the community planning partnership, but the community planning partnership already, you know, delegated that to the Integration Joint Board. So what's been proposed here is a position that we're already in, but again, it's in in relation to responsibility to the local bodies. You know, that's why the uh, IGIB, when you see a structure that has on it um, the council, 
the health board and the community planning partnership because elements of justice and the ADP are actually responsible of the community planning partnership and that's why we say the three things. So, so some of that is, you know, again, what people are consulting on is a position that we are already in and it's not that we're arguing against it for argument's sake. It's in, in terms of it's within local governance. So we've been happy for justice, we've been happy for the ADP, we've been happy for children all to be within our local integration joint board, health and social care partnership. All the years ago, it was me that wrote the letter that said to, to Fiona saying, keep all this stuff you know, together and keep it in there. But it was within the context of local accountability. Feeling that this is getting taken away from local accountability is where that starts to feel really you know, challenging eh, for us. So, you know, issues around, you know, like the ADP uh, is, is there, and I think we need to strengthen what we're, we're saying around that. Issues around mental health services, I think we certainly need to strengthen that to reflect the well-being, you know, like parts of mental, mental health services are not only about, you know, like if I can call them acute mental health services when you're acutely unwell, they're about all the things right back in terms of supports. And, you know, there's some, you know, like, um, shorthand there that needs really beefed up uh, about. But again, you know, with the comments, happy, you know, listen to members. Thank you. I think we've got <coughs> Councillor Mackay, then Councillor Reid. Thank you, Robert. I'm going to try. Can you hear me any better now? Yes, Mori. Um, again, just taking on board what the structures are and where different things sit at different levels of government, governance of Scotland at the moment. I am just curious as to how the implementation time scale of this proposal happens. Now, what I mean by that is I certainly chose to come in and stand for election in local government because I felt that I had something in my experience and skill set that I could offer within local government. And that that was the appropriate place for me to seek to make a contribution to public service within. Now, given that we are talking about fundamentally changing these structures, and we are planning to do this just at the time that people are going to be making decisions about do they stand for election to local government? If they do know what is actually inherent within local government going forward, is there something that we can put in in our response to actually question what the timing is? Because again, as people have said across the chamber, what all of us are committed to doing here is to making a contribution towards public service. So I would imagine that every single one of us made the decision to do that the best way that we possibly could to match against their security. And what I would like to see is that that is absolutely understood if what we are doing is introducing a new structure which has the potential to fundamentally change where those services are actually delivered from. Thank you, Councillor Mackay. Eddie? I think, again, Councillor Mackay makes a, a good point. You know, uh, if someone is, you know, looking to stand in terms of a, a councillor or on a board of a body, it tends to be on the board of a body that they have a particular interest in. You know, so that who might stand uh, as a councillor could be impacted. You know, if there was no influence over health and care services, then there might be, you know, folks say, well, how they got on as, as it speaks about as one of the independent members on to the new health and care board rather than come to the council. So so what actually the body is does have an impact to who, who would want to, to stand for that. Uh, and again, you know, that's a wider question, but again, it's back to that wider question of public sector reform 
and what's the impact on public sector reform that I can set we can certainly put something you know a section around public sector reform and a, a range of different impacts around uh, that um, there. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, Councillor Reid, then Councillor John McGee. As promised, we spoke early on, you know, about unintended consequences and, you know, having to get uh, can illustrations. And I think this is, there's one in here that I think is really important. We had a, a good ministerial visit for uh, the Minister at the North West Centre, Angela Constance, and everything we were doing was what, you know, meeting those objectives in terms of peer support, quick response, you know, and uh, you know the, the work of the ADP and everything that was 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 involved in that. I, I mean, I don't think that's been considered within that. You know, our, our ability to respond in such a way. So it's obviously contradicting two sides, uh, two points of delivery in terms of government policy. And that I, I think we need to hold a mirror up to that, uh, and we can do that uh, in the nicest possible way. We illustrate and just. Uh, some of those things, and I think that's really important just to get the, the message right uh, uh, across. Thank you, Councillor Reid. You done? I'm done. No, 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 no. Councillor <laughs> <coughs> McGee. Thanks, Provost. I, <clears throat> I agree with what uh, Dougie's saying there, uh, and just at the end, the point I was trying to make, but then Dougie says, can uh, say it in the nicest possible way. And I was going to say, uh, Eddie, uh, regarding uh, the language, and Eddie's saying would make it challenging for us, whereas I would maybe say potentially disastrous. So it's how, how we're responding to this paper, and I think that's the point I'm trying to make. And I, and I can maybe chief officers, chief executives, and that, I've got to use different language. But this response is coming to the elected members. And so, while it might well be the, the right word is challenging, I'm no disputing that, but I would say, no, it's no. It's potentially disastrous. And that's the language I think we should be using. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Provost. Just picking up on that point, the exact point, I mean, I think it, there is a potential disaster here. And I think one of the things that you know, we need to bring out is the risk there's a risk factor and I mean I would actually hope that this would now start to appear on the, the council's risk register because there is a huge risk involved in this to our communities and to the, to the actual council itself and the role that the council holds so I think that should be taken into account. Thank you Tom. Any other oh, councillor Reid wants back in? I, 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 was, I was being a wee bit flippant there. Oh, I, I think we've got to make the point, make the point well that it's it's contradictory, uh, and I think that's like, you know, it's like someone said right at the start, use illustrations. I think that's a good a good illustration. Absolutely, well said. Uh, any other comments or questions on this point from members? Oh, we make some progress, Eddie. Uh, <clears throat> Thanks, Provost. And again, around the role of the National uh, Social Work Agency, I think it's appropriate to defer to, to Marion uh, in terms of uh, the impact of a National Social Work Agency. Thank you, Marion. Thanks, Provost. Thanks, Aidy. Um, there are some, obviously, as with much of the consultation, there are some unanswered questions as part of uh, what this actually uh, means and what, what the suggestion is around the National Social Work Agency. There's also questions about how that would interface with the role of the Office of the Chief Social Work Advisor of the Scottish Government, the, the Care Inspectorate, the, the SSSC in terms of the registration body for um, social workers as well. So lots of clarity required around that. T taking that aside, there are some opportunities, I think, that might be positive opportunities from a, from a social work professional perspective. Um, it does talk about um, paying conditions and we know that across Scotland there is a real divergence uh, around pay and conditions across um, local authorities, which can create um, competition that might be unhelpful for some areas. Um, so there's an opportunity there. We know um, there have been some real challenges with supporting um, those students who want to um, qualify as social workers. And I think there are opportunities for a national social work agency in, in supporting newly uh, social work students, um, how they access placements and mindful that 
that placements for students are not just within the local authorities and health and social care partnership, but it's also within third sector organisations um, also. So it would extend much wider than um, local authorities, I guess. Um, so there are, there are opportunities that, again around a consistency of, of, of post-qualifying training and practice for social work. So, so whilst there are a number of unanswered questions, I think there are some um, opportunities that, that exist in the development of this. So um, I would see it in a similar um, way as we have for um, NES, which is the national organisation that supports NHS staff in terms of training and development. So I think those are the key points um, for me. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Marion. Any comments or questions from members? Councillor John McGee. I think uh, Marion makes a, an excellent point there, uh, pointing out the paying conditions. I think that's a very good point. And I just come back to the coast. Ken, when we're for improving paying conditions, which we would all happily stand outside and clap and support, it's the coast here. And this 0.66 billion is starting to look rather uh, tight and it's no really the sum that is required and also none of it's yet went to the actual patient or the person that we're trying to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Any other Councillor Reid? Just to, I mean I think you know some of the frustration I think for the, the government has been in the, the past that the kind of failure to nail the, the living wage issue and you know there's a bit of the baby in the bathwater with us you know uh, and I can understand that but I, I don't think that's, there's enough money in the kitty to resolve this and uh, that's that's an issue and I'm, I would be anxious that every, every, everybody right across Scotland uh, you know be, that's working in the, this, this sector be entitled to a living wage I, I, I would I support that 100% but I don't know if this is going to achieve it. Thank you. Any other comments or questions or points members want to raise in this particular part? Okay, we can move on, Eddie. Thanks, Provost. <coughs> uh, we move on to, to Chapter 4, uh, and this is about, you know, the, the wording is we propose that IGIBs are reformed to become community health and social care boards uh, and will be the delivery body of the National Care Service. From everything here, although it might not be 100% clear, it's not reformed because IGIBs are separate public bodies just now. And from everything I read here, they don't. They now become like an NHS forum thing. They're a subsidiary of a national care service. The same as a health board. It's not a separate public body. It's a subsidiary of the national health service. So, so there, there is a fundamental difference in terms of you know what's been, been said here uh, in terms of, of that. There's also, as, as we said before, the, you know, in page 35, we start to talk about this relationship, and I know it's a complex relationship between an integration joint board and a health and social care partnership, but it's a very important relationship that there's a duality of responsibility between the commissioning and the, the delivery, you know, a, of services. So that dual role between the chief officer and the, um, the, the director of health and social care, this would purport to separate that, very deliberately separate that, so that, you know, the public bodies like yourself as a council, we would become a provider, you know, so if at the end of the day, and, you know, one of the members spoke about a provider of last resort, um, I mean, Eric's still on, and I'm sure he'll tell you how regularly this happens, and it might be helpful to hear from him. Uh, people do come back and give us work back on a Friday afternoon, you know, and actually, as the council, with that responsibility under the Social Work Scotland Act 1968 to provide social care, we actually need to sort that over the weekend. We need to, our home care managers, etc., go and shuffle that all around and actually sort that. If we become a provider, the same as any other provider, we are not, as far as I can see, that provider of last resort. So who in this new commission and body do you actually hand the work back to when, you know, like, someone is, is very, you know, challenging in terms of, of social care to provide uh, social care to uh, some people have, you know, trauma, that that's, that's the result. At the end of the day, we are responsible for that. We have to do that. And actually the split that's been seen here, and I do think it's, you know, that, that the split between the commissioning body and the delivery body 
is now seeing disintegration of health and social care, you know, rather than further promoting uh, health and uh, social care. But again, Provost, and I know it's under a number of officers involved, but it might be helpful, you know, to hear from Eric about some of the roles that we have to take on as provider of last resort. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, Eric Sullivan, if you want to come in, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Provost. Um, yeah, just uh, some very concrete examples in, in, in recent history. Uh, one of our framework providers um, handed back the entirety of, of their caseload to us um, and we had to, to pay across their employees directly to us and pick up uh, on, the, on the slack for those. One of our larger providers, the largest on our framework, um, just the other week handed back 20 plus um, clients um, and I suppose um, just some of the concerns around about that for us is that those were within more rural areas within East Ayrshire uh, and, and more difficult um, for us to then service, but also probably from a provider's point of view, um, some of the most difficult um, areas for them to continue to provide in. So it's it's daily uh, and, and you know, as Eddie describes, it does tend to be on a Friday afternoon and everybody has to scrabble into the evening to be able to cover those shifts. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Any comments or questions so far from members, Councillor John McGee? I, I think when we, we say can the IGIBs are reformed, it goes back to previous comments are made. They're, it's replaced, cease to exist, deed. Can, that's it. And again, the, the provider of last resort raises its seed again. Now, when you get into consultation, the form they've been in here by the choke steward, you any consultation about terms and conditions or wage rises. You can't, you were, your terms and conditions were changing. You came with wage rise, was on the table and there might be a wee bit more there. This is far more complicated than that. And that's what's causing up the great concern. It's going into the unknown. And when we can't have, an, we can't uh, see where the answers are to this, or we haven't got them to know, it's no meaningful consultation. And, and that's what my concern is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Tom Cook. Thanks, Provost. Councillor McGee just reminded me of Monty Python with the dead parrot sketch, but that's for another day. Uh, but no, the point was to make is, you know, it does refer to the employing a chief, you know, chief executive and staff. And again, what we see here is, is money that should be going to the frontline services, going into the administration of, of a service and, and not actually affecting, the, you know, and, improving the lives of the people who need it and you know we've got as i said earlier we've got a very lean financially based system here that's not costing a lot of money at all to run and all i can see is additional costs coming right down the line because there's no mention even in terms of the members of the, the community board whether they're going to be remunerated or not uh, as they are with a lot of these boards or whether they're going to be volunteers but you know we need all that level of detail but it just all adds to me to you know, increase costs and then less money available for the frontline service. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Any other comments, questions so far from members? I'll allow Eddie to move on. OK, Eddie. Uh, thanks, Provost. Uh, in this case, the word reformed comes from, that's the consultation we didn't put reformed in this time. Uh, it also goes on and says, we'll ensure consistency of services across Scotland by going to this central model. Well, there are many central uh, models that are, you know, that actually don't give local uh, consistency. So if you look at performance across a number of them, uh, you will find that they're very different across the, uh, the country uh, in relation to that. This section is also important uh, on page uh, 35, where again we spoke before about, you know, the relationship uh, with the, um, the public protection uh, arrangements. Uh, so it's not just about, you know, adult protection, it's child protection, uh, it's MAPA, it's violence against the uh, women. Uh, and again, just now, you know, the, the chief executive of the council has cha chaired uh, the chief officer group that has an oversight across all that. Fiona did it, I have picked that up because at the end of the day in legislation, we have that responsibility, you know, look for that. This seems to be removing that responsibility without a clarity about where does that responsibility move to? So the relationships across the whole of public protection eh, are also eh, important eh, in terms of where we eh, are eh, here. If I move on eh, from there, the, the next section is around eh, the financial eh, perspective eh, for this. Eh, and again, you know, 
first of all maybe to to Craig and and then to Joe who also had input in terms of this. It might be helpful to hear you know the implications for finance across this. Thank you, Craig. And then Joe, if you're okay to come in, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. So I guess where we are just now in terms of the finances, which is probably quite clear because we have this discussion every year when setting budgets, is that the um, the funding comes from jointly from the health board and from the council, and they provide an allocation to the IGIB. The IGIB then consider at their um, annual budget setting meeting how much they're going to commission back from both of those bodies. And in the early days, that was typically a straightforward whatever money you got from the council, you gave it back to the council to commission services. What we have seen over recent years is that that started to change, where we get money from the bodies and we consider how better to spend the money and it starts to lose its identity and you may commission more or less back from those bodies. Clearly the totality is still the same, but you start to shift the balance in there and that's absolutely right and proper and what integration is all about. Um, so we can start to spend money in, the, in those right areas. Um, so for us, that's worked well. We have an integration scheme that determines how those allocations should be set. Um, the last number of years, we've not been able to follow that to the letter um, because the government have then um, provided additional guidance round about um, annual allocations of budgets and an expectation that IGIB should be given a, um, a, a set amount almost to, to make, make sure that that's protected. It doesn't have a huge impact on us, but it does in other areas of the country where perhaps integration is not working as well. But for us, the financial arrangements have worked really well over the last number of years. Uh, what it does mean typically is that the, the, the IGIB is allocated money at the start of the year. It then has to find its own um, savings to, to basically to, to fund its pressure. So in, in relation to, to pay awards or demographic pressure, etc., we need to swallow our own smoke round about that and make savings the same way as the council and the health board have to do it anyway. Um, so that, that remains consistent and always has done across the piece. What we're talking about here, or what, what has been spoken about here, is that potentially that this would move to direct funding allocations. Eddie's already mentioned the, the impact of what that would be. Um, for the health board, that would be 48% of their overall budget um, being taken off of them and being allocated directly to these new um, boards. And, and similarly for the council, that money would go directly to the, to the, the new boards as well. Um, clearly, there are, there are big implications in there in terms of that ongoing negotiation. It potentially makes it simpler, much simpler, because um, you don't have to have that um, annual negotiation between the two bodies. It does, however, um, present a, a, a range of um, different challenges um, round about the money then being allocated centrally directly to the new boards, um, but then the board having to negotiate with the, the two partner organisations and others how much it's going to commission in relation to service delivery and whether or not there is then enough to actually pay for those services. And I think Eddie had outlined at the start that conversation may be, be then be coming back to, well, you're not giving us enough money to deliver those services. We can't afford to do that. Um, that's easily managed just now because it's just a three-way conversation between the, the three chief executive uh, type officers. Uh, that would very much change um, in this new world. Probably the only other thing I'd want to highlight here is just in relation to the VAT status that they touched on. Um, that, that was a big consideration, as we'll probably all remember, when the, the single police and fire service were created in Scotland. Um, and clearly, if a new organisation was to be created here, uh, that VAT status would be a, a, a very important factor. Um, several folk have mentioned already this morning about the money the additional money that potentially comes um, to, to fund this new way of working. What we want is for the, the vast majority of that to be seen um, directed towards patient care um, and doing the best by our citizens. What we don't want to see is a lot of that seeping out in relation to VAT or other taxation issues. So we need to be really, really clear what the implications around about that will be. Um, and there's certainly not enough clarity within the current proposals to allow that to be um, taken forward in terms of what, what that might look like. But it's certainly a risk that we, we should be highlighting. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. Joe? Thank you, Provost. And I suppose just at the bottom of page 35, it sort of sets out the scene about the Audit Scotland report, recognising that the IGIB budgeting was overly complicated and time consuming. And I suppose for, for East Ayrshire and for our partnership, it, it hasn't been. It's been recognised that um, we have a process in place that's well established and is, is um, collegiate in approach both at an officer and at a member level that sees that budget um, transfer to the IGIB and with the commissioning taking place thereafter. In terms of just some of the points I would raise, it's, it's mentioned again about capital assets, and I suppose if you look at it strict as, as bricks and mortar, it, it becomes something different. But for us, you know, that, that blurring that colleagues spoke about earlier on is evident every day, both in the revenue side and in the capital side. We have Northwest Kilmarnock, where we, we co host uh, colleagues from across. Um, the Council and the Health Board, we do the same in Johnny Walker Bond. 
we're designing a Dune campus that's hopefully going to do the same as well. It's a fundamental part of who we are and the services you wish to provide. And, you know, in terms of VAT, Craig touched on it and others have, have, have earlier. Local authorities are afforded a really beneficial uh, VAT uh, treatment. IGIBs, because they are constituted as local authority bodies, have that same benefit. Um, there is a significant risk here that if in the compilation of the new bodies, that they are not afforded that same um, VAT benefit, then funding that should be spent on care and on people will be spent remitted to HMRC. And I suppose for, for the council, and it's unusual to talk about the council because I talk about the whole thing in its totality. And I look upon the, the IGIB as just another council service. Um, but to stand aside as a council at this point in time, you know, 25 per cent of our budget leaving and going to a new body. And I'm glad and, I, and I, I take the point that we are still waiting for clarity to see the formation of these new bodies. But if it is a result that sees 91 million pounds, leave the council together with a share of staff and housing and legal human resources, finance and ICT then that becomes circa a million pounds. At the same time, though, and as touched on earlier, you know, going back to this, this, just the bones of money is, is more than that. Katie touched on earlier about the, the, the collegiate approach that's taken place between the commissioning side and housing, and also with finance and ICT in terms of the, the benefits, the DWP benefits that can be afforded to maximise that, that benefit and to make sure that the pound that is in that IGIB budget is spent on, on care and on the people who need it most is really important to, to all of us here. But there are so many uncertainties that, that you know, in, 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 the, in the, the bare bones of it, it's the potential for a, a huge chunk of the council's budget to, to leave. Um, and for those of us who were through uh, the 95, 96 disaggregation, we know that when these budgets do move, they leave a tail, then that tail lasts for several years thereafter as that mopping up takes place. So, um, you know, as, as, as other officers said earlier on, we will make this work, but it's it will become um, incredibly challenging to do so. That's sobering comments. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from members? Councillor John McGee. I, I think, uh, listen, the two of our senior officers uh, here, uh, it just reinforces my feeling that it's not going to be challenging. It's potentially disastrous. When we go to the VAT, when would we know that the Treasury has accepted whatever uh, status we're putting in place? And that, that's acceptable to the Treasury. We, we can numerous companies that have befell uh, VAT uh, issues with inland revenue and that. So when would we can the answer to the VAT status? And if you don't know that answer, how can you meaningfully consult? That's my question. Thank you, Eddie. So, I mean, just in the process part of this, you know, they're saying they'll be consulting, we'll get the bill next uh, summer. You know, like, I'm going to make a presumption here that the bill will lay out what the model uh, will be, and it's only when you actually lay out the detail of the model at the same time as that, they can put it to HMRC and for HMRC to make a decision on it. So not till we reach the stage where the consultation is complete, it's become a bill, and then you're putting it to HMRC, basically saying, here's our proposal, you know, because then you take the rest of your proposal, actually changes, and you need to go back to HMRC again and say, ah, we changed that a wee bit. Uh, but, but not till then will you see that, because HMRC is, you know, we all know this, they would look at this, and this is too broad for them just now. It's not got enough detail for them to take a decision on uh, at, at this time. So the, the timing of that, in terms of that, will be, you know, we're saying it'll be next summer, it's within the, the consultation over next summer when we get the actual, uh, the bill, you know, so it'll go only be after that that we'll know that. Thank you, Eddie. Councillor Mackay, then Councillor Grant. Councillor 
Okay, so Maka, are you there? Okay, I'll move on to Councillor Grant and then I've got Councillor George Mayer. Thanks. Um, if you don't mind me using a bit of American legislative nomenclature, but uh, I would consider that what we're discussing today represents uh, a clear and present danger uh, to the population of East Ayrshire. And in our response to this particular request for, for our opinions, um, should reflect that. In fact, I'd even commend using that expression, a clear and present danger, because it has such potential impact in so many parts of what we do and how we treat our people. To take this step with so many unknowns would be, in my opinion, a, a, a sheer folly. So as I say, clear and present danger, I would describe it as that in, in our response. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Joe referred there to the 96 disaggregation, and it's just occurred to me that if you know that they tried to run social work on a regional basis, and without being too disparaging to the her colleagues that work for the region, it obviously wasn't a great success because they changed it. So now we seem to be going back the way. You know, regions didn't work, but we're going to a national service. How do they expect that to work any better? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Any other comments or questions? I've got Councillor Roberts. Thanks very much, Provost. Um, just listen to what Joe was saying. Um, it is pretty sober when you, when you, you look at the figures involved. In relation to the VAC. So that's all going to be dependent on which, uh, what HMRC uh, decides. And HMRC does not have enough information at this moment in time. But if they decide against you know, the, the implications of VAC, then in terms of appropriate funding um, for what we're going to see potentially um, proposed going forward, that leaves a considerable shortfall. So I think we have to be absolutely clear in terms of the risks going forward that the VAT one is uh, a major issue and uh, you know that has to be resolved sooner rather than later. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from members? Okay, Eddie, can we move on? Uh, thanks, Provost. Uh, and for one of the folk that was around the disaggregation, I don't believe George Mayer that it was social work that brought down the region. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> Mary would say it was the, the fact that our welfare rights officers were so good at what they'd done that the, the government at that time uh, didn't like us too much. Um, so <laughs> if we, the next section is actually, we've touched on it uh, before, around public protection arrangements. And I do think it's important that we, we lay them out in, in that level of, of detail. I think we've discussed them before, but again, if we could just check with Marion to make sure there's nothing more that, that she would want to add in. Sure, Marion, if you can come in on that point. Provis, thank you, members. The only thing I would want to add is throughout the pandemic, um, our enhanced public protection arrangements, which involved um, our, senior, our new senior manager at that point, um, bringing all the agendas around public protection. So our lead officers for, for the Child Protection Committee, our lead officers for the, the Adult Sport and Protection Committee, violence against women, alcohol and drugs and so on. So we brought all of those individuals under one individual uh, and one manager. And what we saw were enhanced arrangements throughout the pandemic, which I think the chief officers group were highly commending of in terms of recognising particularly new and emerging risks to individuals. And I think it just highlights the importance of that for, for for fear of being repetitive highlights the importance of that joined up collaborative um working communication and um relationships across all of those areas of work and um, so that's the only point i would want to emphasize in that regard thank you thank you marine any other comments or questions from members Is it there? okay tom cook legacy hard sorry okay Anything else from members? Tom, you're 
Hands went back up again. Oh, that's it away. No, that's back. I'm assuming you're not wanting in, so we'll move on, Eddie. Uh, thanks, Provis. Uh, there are exceptions around membership of the new uh, boards. And again, you know, part of this come up, you know, like because uh, there were a number of the, the non-voting members of, of IJBs uh, in different places would, would say that they, you know, they felt that second class members of the board uh, because of that. Uh, the way that the East Ayrshire Integration Joint Board uh, has worked has been around collaboration rather than, you know, getting to, to votes, uh, etc. So everyone has had their opportunity to have their say. And it is often people who are the, you know, the, the non-voting members that are, you know, there, you know, whether you're the CBO or Scottish Care or whatever, you're, you're there and you're able to, to have your, your say. Um, so that that there and the wider thing to make sure wider stakeholders uh, have a say. You know, we also have a stakeholders you know forum within the the, the IJB. You know, the, the Margaret Phelps is very much you know developed and made sure a wide range of people were able to input, and then people from that forum come to the IJB and can can relay that. So. I know this feels like repetitive, but in terms of the membership of the community health and social care boards, the proposals in, within this paper are trying to fix a problem that we don't have. You know, to, to be quite honest, and you know, uh, that that's, that becomes here. What it it does take away, and it was why the um, the local elected members and the non-executive members of the health board were voting members when other people were not. It reflected that decisions taken at that board could have an impact back in the statutory duties of the council and the statutory duties of the health board. And therefore, that was why there was a differentiation between the voting members and non-voting members, because there was always a concern that people who didn't have the duties would put their hands up for things, and then councils or health boards would need to try and fix it in the background. So that's why there was a difference. But actually, you know, that's not been a, a factor in what we, we do. Uh, at all. Within that section, you know, as well, you know, we have, there was a bit about the um, the staff are in there and we'll maybe reflect that again a wee bit uh, later on. We've only got a few bits to go. Uh, but again, you know, within it, you know, for us, we do have our staff forums, etc. cetera, uh, that, you know, both the NHS and the council staff can fully input. And the way the consultation has gone is it, it, it tends to, it, it doesn't emphasise enough that there is a high number of actual staff and what happens to staff within these services. There's, there's a lack of clarity eh, around eh, that in terms of, of where we where we are to. But the main issue for that was about membership of the, the, the board. Eh, and again, you know, just saying that that's for us, I would suggest, a problem that um, we don't have that's trying to be solved. Thank you. Eddie. Any other comments or questions in, from members? Or can we make some progress? Councillor Cook. I don't see. No, OK. No, my hands are no, I didn't think so. I think, I think the problem is that we're, the officers... Um,